I requested all the panelists to please mute their audio.
हेलो हेलो Hello, good afternoon. Am I audible? Hello.
Hello, am I audible? Yeah, ready, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah, you're audible. Am I audible? Yeah. Please write in the chat box if I am audible. Good afternoon. Hello. <laughs> okay, sir. Good afternoon. We are about to start, sir. Yes, I'm ready. Okay, sir. Okay. Just wait, sir, for three minutes. Okay.
हेलो कटकी सर हेलो कटकी सर या कैन यू हियर मी या 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 ऑडिबल ऑडिबल ओके ओके सो जस्ट जस्ट वेट सम स्मॉल फॉर्मेलिटी या सम स्मॉल फॉर्मेलिटीज आर देयर ओके 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 सर ओके सर थैंक यू थैंक यू ना नहीं ये कोई नहीं हेलो आके डर सर please join rk datta sir in panelist
Hello, Doctor Sir. Can you hear me? Ah, yes, yes, I can yeah, hear. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you, sir. Thank you. So can you hear me? All, yeah, 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 yeah. Audible, audible, sir. Okay. So, uh, so we are all all this. set, sir. Yeah. So, okay. um, actually, now we are we are, we are about to start our session. So, Bidhi sir. Yes. Bidhi sir. Yes, sir. Yes, okay, sir. Okay. Okay. Start. Start the session. Yeah. Bidhi sir. Yes, sir. Okay, start. Good afternoon, everyone. Honorable Vice Chancellor of Assam Science and Technology University, Dr. Dheeraj Bora, sir. Honorable Principal of Assam Engineering College, Dr. Otul Bora, sir. Academic Registrar of the University, Dr. Vishwaranjan Pukan, sir. Head of the Department, Mechanical Engineering, Assam Engineering College, Dr. Ranjit Kumar Dr. Sir, Honor Honorable Guest Lecturer of the Day, Dr. Rupam Katoki Sir, and all the participants across the globe. On behalf of the organizing committee, I, Vidisha Setia, would like to extend you a warm welcome to the webinar series on Emerging Technologies in Biofuel Production 2020 organized by the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Assam Engineering College, in association with Assam Science and Technology University under TechKeep3. So biofuel has become the most promising energy in today's world. Due to the depletion of the, uh, conventional energies, it is gaining more popularity day by day. To spread more light on this topic, this webinar series has been organized now, may I now request our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, to give a small welcome address to the participants. Over to you, sir. Thank you, Vidisha. Uh, respected Principal, Assam Engineering College, respected academic Registrar of uh, Assam Science and Technology University, advisor to today's uh, webinar, Dr. Ranjit Kumar Dutta, HOD Mechanical Engineering of AEC. Then we have uh, the most important two persons, coordinators of this meeting, Prashanta Chaudhary and Bharat Kakati. So with this, uh, my pleasure to participate in this webinar along with all the, I can see more than 150 participants which are, uh, I assume, the faculties and students of uh, our uh, colleges around to participate in this webinar series on emerging technologies in biofuel production. And this is being organized jointly by AEC and Assam Science and Technology University under the banner of TechUp3. TechUp3 has uh, helped us, especially the university, in uh, propagating, interfacing with most of the colleges, schools as well, uh, in the state, in the Northeast, to propagate science on the whole. As Idisha already told about the energy crisis, what the world is going through, along with the environmental issue, the environmental degradation, people are forced to now look for various different uh, scientific technological ways of bringing down uh, these uh, environmental degradation as well as 
uh, find out other ways of producing uh, energy to feed us, to grow into a bigger uh, economic powerful state as a whole in the country and as a state for Assam and the Northeast as a region. As uh, we know, biofuel is drawing a lot of attention worldwide. This is because it can serve as a substitute, especially for petroleum, which is derived a transport fuel to help. This will help addressing some of the issues which we just now uttered, mainly the global warming, which falls into the, uh, into the environmental degradation category, energy security, as well as energy cost. So these are issues which are being addressed with the help of biofuels, which is, uh, uh, as I said, gaining popularity, I would say, around the globe. As I understand, as a non-specialist in the field, I would say biofuel would mean to me any liquid fuel made from plant material that can be used as a substitute for petroleum derived fuels. Now these biofuels can include very familiar uh, products like ethanol or, uh, or other, other products like, let us say, dimethyl ether, etc., which could basically serve as biofuels. And these are all derived from uh, a biomass, which we have in abundance all around the uh, state. Recently, there have been classifications of these biofuels. And people talk of first generation and second generation fuels. I would say these are basically related to the feedstock we use. If we are using something which is basically, uh, I would say from the edible category, then we basically talk of something which fall into the uh, first generation. Similarly, we have the second generation, which we can uh, basically derive this uh, fuel from non-edible uh, lignocellulosic biomass. Basically, these are non-edible, therefore we would prefer to have it because we do not want to deplete our edible uh, biosources, what we have. So biofuels, this has, I mean, people have interest in this biofuel, uh, many different uh, interests depending on which region you belong to. It has very many several regions out of which it could be because of the climates are suited to grow this biomass. And therefore, I would say that it has a climatic touch to the whole issue. Actually, this is a, 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 a source which is inherently, I would say, rural. And it is quite labor intensive. And it, of course, has very many prospects of the so-called new employments, what we uh, are uh, really in need of. Now, it needs to look for some inexpensive and more sustainable oil feedstock. This is what is basically a critical step, which we need to sort out to get a cost-effective uh, biodiesel. Now, uh, we are 
now talking of microalgae which is basically a microorganism which is now receiving a prominent uh, uh, place into this biofuel activities this is mainly because of the of its high oil content and growth rate and they have been considered that is why as a potential feed stock that can replace the conventional diesel which uh, we are uh, looking for so this is something which is now in the offing and the oil content of such feed stocks can actually it is usually between i would say 20 to 50% but in some cases this could reach even up to about 80% so it is interesting that one talks of microalgae uh, cells which not only contains the oil but it contains even other things like the protein the carbohydrates and the lipids which extend the application of algae into other areas as well so these are some very interesting aspects of uh, biofuel which is being studied being uh, researched upon by experts all around the globe now uh, let me not go into uh, too many of these general introductory remarks now i would uh, uh, like to say that this is a very very a uh, useful seminar webinar people are uh, holding where we have actually experts from very many different fields we have people who talk on the bio waste not only that one would talk of even integration of emerging technologies to have this kind of clean power generation possibilities around us not only that we will be hearing experts on even characterization the role of characterization in the research of bio waste conversion etc etc so uh, i am sure all of us will gain a lot and i thank once again the organizers to call me to participate in this meeting uh, i do have interest in this area also to some extent we do have some small experiments which are going on in uh, astu we have collaborations with uh, uh, ac and others on this area as well so i uh, once again thank all of you to inviting me uh, to participate in this meeting and give a few introductory remarks of somebody who is very new to this kind of fuel uh, fuel production and fuel consumption i belong to the other end actually which is basically the nuclear energy production and uh, uh, propagation of uh, such technologies so i thank you and wish you all the best and have a good time uh, during these two days thank you very much thank you sir thank you thank you so much sir for your kind and inspiring words now i would like to request our advisor head of the department mechanical engineering of assam engineering college professor ranjit kumar dr sir to address the attendees sir hello am i audible i think yes, yes. sir yes yes honorable vice chancellor of assam science and technology university academic registrar of assam science and technology university principal of assam engineering college um research persons for the webinar emerging technologies for biofuel production the organizers uh sri prashant kumar choudhury and sri parod kakoti participants and well wishers for this uh webinar I feel privileged to be a part of this webinar. 
which is very useful and uh, it is a very well researched area over a long time. But um, the theme of this webinar, Emerging Technologies for Biofuel Production. And we are always eager to learn what are the emerging technologies right now, because we know certain uh, technologies for the production of biofuels, but what are the new biofuel, uh, what are the technologies that have emerged recently for this production of biofuel? And uh, this is a very useful uh, topic because we all, all the people uh, need uh, fuel for what transportation and daily use, as well as a massive amount of fuel is utilized in the transportation sector and the price of goods is dependent upon that. So it affects the masses. So it is quite useful. And uh, I always long for having one uh, type Emerging technologies with the selection of right biofuel materials, the, uh, this one refining of the biofuel, making it environment friendly by the technologies that people, researchers, uh, of mankind. Um, time is quite valuable. It is quite short for a webinar like this. If it is seminar or probably short term course, uh, it would have been possible for a long time. Uh, so I will not take much of your time. I welcome all the participants for this webinar jointly organized by Assam Saigon Technology University as well as Department of Mechanical Engineering, Assam Engineering College. And uh, I hope it will be a grand success and uh, I bless you all. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for your kind words. Now, it would be our honor to introduce you the first lecturer of the day, Dr. Rupam Kotoki, sir, Professor, Department of Energy, Tejpur University, who have come here to spread his knowledge on low value bio waste valorization to energy and chemicals with zero waste. Dr. Kotoki sir had received his BSc and MSc from Assam Agricultural University, Jorhat. After completion of his PhD from Tejpur University, he started his professional career in the Northeastern Regional Institute of Water and Land Management as an assistant professor and currently serving as professor in the Department of Energy, Tejpur University. Looking at his excellent academic achievements, Dr. Kotoki had received top reviewer award 2017 from Bioresource Technology, Elsevier, best poster awards in many national and international conferences on renewable energy, biotechnology, etc. His research interest includes thermochemical conversion of biomass and bio, uh, to biofuel and biochar, utilization of agricultural and industrial waste for recovery of fuels and chemicals, biodiesel production from indigenous tree-borne oil yielding species of Northeast India, etc. Till date, Dr. Kotoki has edited four books and contributed to numerous amounts of book chapters and journals. Also, he is a life member of Indian Science Con Congress Association, Biotech Research Society of India. It is our honor to have you among us, sir. Now, I would like to request Dr. Kotoki, sir, to share your valuable words. Over uh, to you, thank you, sir. Yeah. thank you so much for your kind introduction. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Assam Sanction Technology University, Professor Deiraz Bora, Academic Registrar, <coughs> Assam Sanction Technology University, uh, Principal Assam Engineering College, Head of the Department of Mechanical Engineering, Assam Engineering College, uh, Coordinators of this webinar, uh, my dear Prasanta and uh, Dr. Kakati, Bharat Kakati from us too. And then other members of the panelists, panel, 
and then dear participants. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor has rightly pointed out the importance of uh, biomass and bioenergy and biofuels in the recent times. Uh, biomass and biofuels, you know, they are very, very important in the context because they uh, contribute to the uh, biofuels, they can be uh, pr produce biofuels at the cost of no uh, net emission of carbon dioxide. That is very, very important. No net emission of carbon dioxide. So unlike other uh, petrol-based fuels. And then, you know, biomass and bioenergy has been utilized or used by the mankind right from the dawn of civilization. And then biomass and bioenergy, modern biomass and bioenergy can be, you know, huge, uh, can create huge employment avenues. And then it can uh, rapidly enhance the rural development. So there are so many advantages uh, in spite of it, uh, some several severe, uh, severe uh, limitations also. In spite of this, the severe uh, limitations, biomass and bioenergy and biofuels has got its own advantages, and for which I believe, you know, the world has, you know, researched and researched on more on biofuels. Uh, uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor has also spoken about the uh, first generation biofuel, second generation biofuel, algae. Uh, I'm really sure, though, a man of nuclear energy, he has uh, kept everything, new things in mind about biofuels and bioenergy. So, uh, yes, really, the first generation biofuel, the days of biofuel, first generation biofuel is almost over, at least in India, because we cannot afford to, uh, you know, use the uh, first generation biofuel, which are mostly you know, crop plants. So the government of India has several, several restrictions on the use of food crops for fuel purpose because there is a, a food versus fuel problem. So second generation biofuels, which are mostly lignocellulosic in nature, are, you know, the government of India you know, says that these are the fuels for the, these are the feedstocks for the future. And in that case, this is not only government of India's uh, viewpoint, it even the European Commission has also said that also said that yes, it is the lignocellulosic biomass that has to be the feedstock for uh, almost all different kinds of biomass and conversion processes. And uh, you know, uh, almost all the uh, recent uh, biomass conversion techniques, you know, they are based on lignocellulosic biomass only. So with this introduction, let me uh, go to the the, the lecture. Uh, I'd like to share the screen. Yeah, is it, is it's it coming, not? coming, coming, sir. It's visible. Okay, okay, okay. So, uh, so, so, would you please make it full screen? Oh yeah, sure, sure. Is it okay? Okay, good, fine, fine, sir. So, so I have slightly uh, changed the topic, Prasanta, without your permission. <laughs> what I said uh, before, probably now it is a bit different, but no, okay, uh, sir. Yeah, okay. everything remains the same, but then. Topic I will simply uh, change a bit. So energy and materials and chemicals recovery from bio waste. Uh, even the vice chancellor asked to also mention about the. Sir, your sound is not coming. Hello, sir. Hello, sir. Hello. Hello, sir. Thank you. 
Dear participants, actually you have patience. There's a little bit of technical problem from the speaker's side. He's shortly joining. He's shortly joining. Okay, Tilly, join uh, uh, me, myself, Mr. P. K. Chaudhary, the coordinator of the webinar on the Emerging Technologies in Biofuel Production. I welcome you all to the program. So as we are all aware of the fact that our natural resources are depleting day by day, and there is also the issue that's uh, becoming very serious of the environmental issue due to the use of the fossil fuel. So it has led to the what, search of the biofuel and uh, the biomass as a useful alternative environmental friendly energy resource. So that's why that is the main motive of this uh, webinar hour. Uh, so it will be held in the two days two, and there will be all total the four sessions will be there. Uh, uh, the total, all total the four uh, sessions will be there and the people we have borrowed from uh, IIT Guwahati, uh, Tesco University, then NIT Silchar. So today, this is Dr. Rupam Kotoki, he is uh, presenting right now. So after this, uh, Mr. Biplop Das, Dr. Biplop Das from NIT Silchar, uh, he'll be joining, he'll be delivering his lecture. And tomorrow's the first lecture will be given by Dr. Pankas Kalita from IIT Guwahati. 
then the Manos Bordoloi, the assistant professor, Department of Mechanical Engineering, Tesco University. So in the uh, meantime, uh, we have already given the chat box. So during the presentation, uh, if you have got any query, uh, then you can raise the questions in the chat box. And after the lecture is over, the research person will be explaining one by one. Uh, the each, uh, each session of the Zoom link will be providing for the tomorrow's session will be providing today in the WhatsApp group. And all the participants are requested not to leave the WhatsApp group till they get their e-certificates. So kindly uh, have patience, please. Uh, uh, he is shortly joining. He's got some little bit of issue, the technical problem it is just from his side. And on successful completion and uh, all the sessions and the submission of the feedback form, all will be given the e-certificates. OK, thank you. Kotaki sir, Kotaki sir. Yeah, yeah, I can hear you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. It's okay. It's okay. Sorry, sorry for that. Sorry for that. Actually, today I am on leave, and that's how I'm uh, <laughs> calling out from home, okay, and that's not the whole problem. Okay, 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 sir. okay, sir. okay. Okay, okay. I'll be very fast. <laughs> okay, so, uh, so I was talking about bio waste. <clears throat> uh, so bio waste has got so many advantages. So this is idea. Uh, Sorry, it's okay. Yeah, okay. Okay, you just make the full screen if you're possible. Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah. Yeah. So to introduce the subject of uh, this subject, I know uh, the susceptibilities of the present energy system, uh, you know, it mostly originates from the dependence uh, primarily on fossil fuels, non-renewable, which are non-renewable, which are limited and, uh, you know, which are depleting resources. That is when burned emit, you know, in environment changing greenhouse gases. So these two challenges, uh, that is uh, depletion of uh, uh, fossil fuel and climate change. You know, these two challenges, and uh, of course there are many other uh, challenges too of the fossil fuel, like energy security, which are very important for countries like us. So it necessitates action for the world uh, to avoid economic and environmental calamity because we are, our economy depends on the petroleum fuel. Therefore, a move, you know, uh, away from the existing dependence on fossil fuels, you know, has become necessary. And there is a need for transition from renewable and uh, sorry, and uh, uh, petroleum energy or fossil fuel based uh, dominated energy use portfolio to renewable energy, you know, dominated energy use portfolio. There's a need for transition of this. You know, it is estimated that about 18 percent, uh, okay, maybe this 18 percent may be a bit uh, high or low, I uh, mean, uh, I'm not very sure about this statistics. 18% uh, of the total global primary energy consumption has been con uh, you know, contributed by renewable energy. 
and among the renewables biomass is predominant for various uses such as heat you know then power then transportation fuels and maybe for you know household fuels and biomass resources and their utilization offer a you know paradigm for research in solving various problems emerging from the excessive use of fossil fuels we know we all know that biomass can be directly used for cooking or heating which we can see in many of the homes or indirectly by converting it to different forms of energy like gaseous fuel solid fuel liquid fuel so biomass has the most unique advantage of you know converting it to all all the three forms of energy there is solid liquid and gaseous as you can see over here the major paths for biomass conversion for biofuel so there are a number of different technologies exist and different uh, for different kind of feedstocks and you know different uh, uh, end products different end products we can see over here so here you can see the lignocellulosic feedstock here you can see the starch and sugar feedstocks here you can see the lipid feedstocks so these feedstocks can be converted through different conversion technologies to obtain different kinds of you know uh, end products uh the contribution of renewable energy sources to the total final energy consumption you know is a key factor we all know that in determining the progress of renewables worldwide and among renewables biomass is the largest contributor of the global energy supply which is closely uh, sorry uh, followed by hydropower and uh, other renewables such as so, uh, wind solar tidal geothermal which accounts for only 2% biomass has always been an essential source for energy in india that we all know considering the advantages it provides for the production of cooking gas power generation and other useful recycled products in fact the rural india mostly depends on biomass for their food fuel fodder uh, fiber uh, for various needs almost on biomass based society our society is biomass based when the rest of the society is going for bioeconomy we can say that our society has been predominantly bioeconomy bio right from you know uh, the civilization dawn of civilization so as you know india is one of the fastest growing economies in the world and you know because of the demographic uh, dividend we will continue to enjoy that probably for the next few decades in this regard government of india has you know uh, prepared a road map to reduce the import of dependency in oil and gas sector that is uh, to strengthen our energy security uh, by adopting a, a five prong strategy which includes adaptation of biofuels and renewables this envisages a strategic role for biofuels in the indian energy basket in this regard government of india has formulated the national biofuel policy 2009 however due to various constraints the target of the policy could not be achieved completely and you know a new national biofuel biodiesel policy biofuel policy 2018 was formulated this new a national policy on biofuels or national biofuel policy 2018 you know it builds on the achievements of the earlier national policy on biofuels and uh, sets new agenda consistent with the redefined role of emerging developments in the renewable sector this policy aims to bring in renewed focus taking into context the international perspective and national scenario primarily by utilization of indigenous feedstocks for production of biofuels the policy also dwells on the development of the next generation biofuel conversion technologies based on a new feedstocks and promote domestically available feedstocks exploring and utilizing the country's biodiversity that's very very important as you can see over here the goal of 20% blending of ethanol in petrol and 5% blending of biodiesel in diesel by proposed by 2030 to be achieved one of the you know the ways to achieve as set up in the national biofuel policy 2018 is that 
setting up second generation biofinery and development of new feedstocks for biofuels as, as well as development of new technologies for conversion to biofuels. So here we'll be speaking about the biorefinery. Why biorefinery? So biorefineries, more similar to the petroleum refineries, where in petroleum refineries we get a lot of products, a lot of end products. A complex, bio a complex refinery produces number of products right from jet fuel to kerosene fuel to, uh, to uh, wax, diesel, and all, all these. So in the same line, a biorefinery is also, you know, uh, uh, produces a number of products, a number of different biofuels. It can produce number of different biofuels, the number of different chemicals, number of different materials. And development of new feedstock for biofuels. This is very, very important. New feedstock for biofuels is very, very important because we cannot only rely on the existing feedstocks. Existing feedstock may come into the, may, may be uh, depleting also. So it is very, very develop, uh, important to develop new feedstocks as far as possible and development of new technologies. So these are some of the saline points of the National Biofuel Policy 2018. So in this regard, the government of India has always said that by 2030, maybe around 5% uh, diesel blending has to be done by biodiesel. So this is the biodiesel production uh, from multiple feedstocks in India. As of now, I'm not going to the details of this. So let us see the economics of biodiesel production. So the key factors of production of biodiesel, because you know why I'm talking about the economics of biodiesel production, because we can talk about biodiesel, but as long as the, it is not competitive with the petrol diesel, People are, not, people are not going to use it. So it needs to be, it has to be, you know, uh, competitive with the petrodiesel. So there are a number of key factors of production which are being identified as feedstock cost, yield, conservation cost, product quality, biodiesel sale price, glycerin sale price, biodiesel, byproduct utilization, energy cost, investment. So these are some of the, you know, uh, important uh, parameters on which the, the, uh, the economics of biodiesel production depends on. And uh, especially the feedstock cost is very, very important. So as far as feedstocks are important, uh, feedstocks are uh, mentioned, as I have already said that government of India uh, policy on feedstock says that we must invest in you know, uh, biofuels that achieve real emission cuts, but at the same time, it must not compete with the food. So we must identify those feedstocks which do not compete with food. So government of India regulation clearly says that you know, lignocellulosic biomass is, a, is going to be the key component of India's future biofuels and bioenergy agenda. Interestingly, the European Commission has also echoed similar views on feedstocks for biofuel. So therefore, I say there is a similarity between the India's biofuel policy and the European Commission's biofuel policy. So let us see the feedstocks for biofuel production. So there are, you know, different, uh, uh, around 350 oil bearing crops identified as potential sources. There are different types of feedstocks for producing biodiesel, which are of course dependent upon a number of factors as we have outlined over here. But however, before selecting a feedstock, the number of requirements, it has got number of requirements which you look into, which are like production cost, production cost of the feedstock, what is the production cost of the feedstock? Which is very, very important. As I've already said, that this is one of the determining factors in the production, in the, in the overall economics of the biodiesel. Then scale of production, how much it is produced, how much the feedstock produced. In case of a non-edible oil seed bearing crop species, tree species, crop species or tree species, how much on uh, uh, oil species is produced. And most importantly, the oil percentage. Because what is the oil percentage? If we, the oil, even if, the, if it is produced is high, production is high, but oil percentage is less, certainly it's not going to be a suitable feedstock. So these are some of the you know, characteristics that we look into in a feedstock. Then types of feedstocks, you know, uh, there are edible visible oils, which are called as first generation feedstock. Our honorable vice chancellor has also mentioned in his uh, introductory speech, which are rapeseed soybean peanut. There are countries which can afford to use this kind of rapeseed soybean peanut, sunflower palm, coconut oil, but we in India, we cannot afford to use this kind of, you know, uh, visible oils or edible oils because we are, we are, uh, uh, not self-sufficient in these uh, oils. We rather we import, you know, edible oils from outside. So to meet the biodiesel requirement, uh, as set in the national biofuel policy, there is no other option but to, you know, but to uh, depend on non-edible visible oils for countries like ours, which are Jatrapa Karanja. Jatrapa Karanja are the most, you know, uh, sought after or most mostly researched tree species 
you know, Zetrofa Kranja, Simen Goyalgi, Herofetch, etc. Then waste to recycle the oil, oil, animal fats. These are also uh, some of the, you know, feedstocks which can be utilized. Then, of course, there are, you know, edible oil, uh, as you have already said, edible oil uh, as a feedstock has got so many limitations. The first and foremost limitation is the food versus fuel crisis. And uh, it can also lead to the deforestation for, uh, you know, making available the arable land for growing the edible oils. Uh, so there are, you know, a number of limitations of uh, edible oil as a feedstock. Then non-edible oil, of course, it has, uh, you know, they are, uh, has got in, uh, in, uh, against the limitations of edible oil oils, non-edible oil oils has got so much of you know uh, advantages like easy availability throughout the world, eliminates the competition for food, uh, reduce deforestation rate. In fact, it can you know increase or enhance the afforestation rate. It is more efficient and run friendly. It can be you know uh, produce uh, local employment. So there are a number of uh, you know benefits of non-edible oil species. And some non-edible oil plants uh, and their estimated yields are given over here. There are many more, but then just just a, a beginning introduction. Then these are some of the non-edible oils and their properties on, uh, on the, of the produced by These are some of the non-edible oil seeds which are being researched throughout the world. We have around the zone over here, 40 different tree species. Out of that, maybe around eight to 10 species. We have worked in our department, in the Department of Energy at Tejpur University. We have been also working on biodiesel, uh, different types of biodiesel feedstocks. So uh, around 40 different tree species. There are many more, I believe, but then only uh, we are showing over 40 over here. So these 40 different tree species can be utilized for, uh, you know, uh, biodiesel production. And their biodiesel properties are, you know, uh, very, very uh, favorable for use in the engine without any modification. Then uh, in our quest for, uh, uh, quest for you know new feedstock as pointed out in the national biofuel policy 2018 government of india says that we must identify new feedstocks so in your quest for that uh, we try to find out the potential tree borne oil seeds of northeast india because as you know the northeast india has a you know you know the biodiversity hotspot uh, and then we try to find out you know the potential tree borne oil seeds in northeast india so as you can see over here uh, we we inventorized around uh, 48 different tree species from the two states of Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. And I believe there are many more uh, this kind of non-edible oil, oil yielding tree species if we can inventorize throughout the Northeast India. So these are the, you know, these are uh, oil yielding tree, spe tree species. Of course, there are a lot of works to be uh, yet to be done. Uh, uh, we have just uh, tried to see their oil content, and, but then the quality of the oil, and then, then their uh, conversion ability, then their biological characteristic. A lot of uh, work has to be done, but in a preliminary work, uh, we have identified these 48 tree species. Uh, in, or in, rather, we have inventorized these 48 different tree species from the two states. So, <clears throat> of course, there are a few limitations of non edible oil seeds also because they are scattered. They, first of all, their feedstocks are, they are scattered, they are not plentifully available. Uh, enough in a single space. So this is one of the major drawbacks of you know, non edible oil seeds. Uh, and then biodiesel derived from visible oil and animal fats has a relatively poor performance in cold weather. So these are some of the technical uh, problems also, but at the same time, keeping in mind the advantages of non edible oil uh, it, uh, it offers, I believe uh, we have no other option but to go for non edible oil seeds for biodiesel production. Then algae, uh, as a feedstock for biodiesel production, the, uh, the vice chancellor has already pointed out that uh, the algae has got high photosynthetic efficiency, high growth rhythm productivity, high oil content. This is true. This algae has got uh, algae is a very promising feedstock as far as their photosynthetic, high photosynthetic efficiency is concerned, growth rhythm productivity, oil content are concerned. That is true. But at the same time, algae also has got some of the obstacles, right? Like uh, you know, high production cost, requiring high oil yielding algae strains and you no know, requirement of large scale bioreactors. So these are some of the you know, limitations of or obstacles of algae as a feedstock for biodiesel production. But in spite of this, they are considered as provisioning feedstock. Of late, the government of India has started a new program uh, which is called uh, RUCO, uh, Repurpose Used Cooking Oil, where you know, government of India says that uh, the uh, cooking oils uh, you know, after a number of cooking, it becomes, uh, it develops some polar compounds which are, you know, uh, toxic to our human body. So 
these oils actually are not uh, consumable uh, but then the, the the eateries and restaurants they keep on using this which are you know which can be harmful to human body but then uh, unless and until they have a proper use of this cooking oil it is it cannot be also expected that they will not stop they will stop using this oil so the ruko uh, tries to um, you know uh, use the repurpose uh, use cooking oil for biodiesel uh, production so there is a you know uh, framework uh, uh, prepared for utilization of ruko uh, or uh, for this purpose for conversion to biodiesel so in the background of this study so here in this study uh, we tried to you know uh, 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 took two different uh, tree species uh, oil yielding tree species and then you know we try to see uh, how they behave how they you know yield the oil how they behave how the biodiesel production is uh, taking place and then the the quality of biodiesel the characteristics of biodiesel and then their emission characteristics their engine characteristics and then the and most important in the the bio waste that are generated during the biodiesel production process like the oil cakes it covers you know uh, they are in this process we are trying to utilize it through a cascade of approaches through a cascade of approaches to obtain different kind of products so we are going to so over here what we are going to do uh, so so what we are trying to do in this work that we took two different three species we are trying to see the uh, the oil oil uh, and then the converted to biodiesel and then the byproducts that are obtained you know are uh, you know utilized uh, uh, in different approaches to a cascade of approaches to different energy and materials with a zero waste so we can see over here that in this uh, work there is no waste generated almost all the uh, plant parts are uh, or all the chemical groups of the you know uh, the oil seed is being utilized so we can say it's a kind of a bio refinery it's a kind of a bio refinery because only not only one product is generated but a you know number of products are generated and uh, with a different cascade of approaches different approaches are being utilized with zero waste so it's more like a refinery so here is a bio refinery concept uh, which you know can be different for different feedstocks different approaches and different intended products so here is our work in a uh, flow chart so what we can so so over here that this is a non edible oil seeds we have taken non edible oil seeds so we have uh, you know separated the seed kernel and the seed cover the seed kernel you know the uh, seed kernel uh, after grinding we have we go for the vegetable oil extraction can be it can be done through different processes but the vegetable oil you know uh, you know it goes for uh, esterification and transterification to yield biodiesel and glycerol glycerol has got you no know, different industrial uses like animal feedstock green soil and feedstock for chemicals etc and biodiesel can be you know you know uh, by the use of biodiesel so i'm not going to repeat it about about it in the in the process of uh, conversion of seed kernel to vegetable oil a good amount of dual seed cakes are also generated the dual seed cakes and the seed cover the seed cover dual seed cake and the seed cover can be you know uh, an excellent feed stock they are lignocellulosic feed stock and they can be you know the starting point or feed stock for another process another energy conversion process which we call as thermochemical conversion process or we can say it's a pyrolysis so the dual seed cake and the seed cover you know they act as a feed stock for pyrolysis and pyrolysis or thermochemical conversion is a way through which we can you know convert any type of waste into three different products that is solid liquid and gas solid product is we call it as a char liquid product we call bio bio oil and the syn gas so that is the beauty of the pyrolysis process or thermochemical conversion process in this process any type of waste can be converted to different types of products so here pyrolysis in the pyrolysis process the char is produced the char has got an, an immense uh, different uses from soil emolgorate to you know super capacitors it can be used as soil amendment to super capacitors it can be used for waste water reclamation for as building materials as uh, you know additives in animal feed so there are numerous uses of char uh, in the recent literature if you go through biochar you will find that there are numerous uh, literatures which suggest the uses of biochar for uh, different types of uses again the char can also be utilized as a solid acid catalyst and this solid acid catalyst you know can be utilized for replacing the 
inorganic catalysts which are being used in the production of biodiesel here in this process. In the production of biodiesel, we use inorganic catalysts, so the solid acid catalysts which are being prepared from the char, which is a byproduct of the pyrolysis process, you know, can be utilized. So here we replace the inorganic catalyst and we use the solid acid catalyst over here. Then the, then the bio oil, bio, bio oil can be, you know, upgraded. Bio oil can be upgraded because bio oil has got so much of uh, limitations, though it's a, you know, bio oil is regarded as a, you know, uh, storehouse of different types of chemicals, but uh, bio oil can be, you know, uh, upgraded by different technique, techniques depending upon the intended use. It's and different intended and end use. Again, the bio oil can be, you know, utilized for different other purposes. Raw bio oil can also be utilized for different other purposes. The gas can be, you know, again, used in different, for different purposes. So what we can see over here, the one product, one feedstock is utilized through a cascade of approaches, right? Here also I have forgot to mention one thing, the DOL seed cake, in our work, we have shown that the DOL seed cake can also be converted to excellent mosquito repellents. So DOL seed cake, apart from its as a feedstock, apart from its use as a feedstock, DOL seed cake can also be utilized for conversion to a uh, uh, the mosquito repellent. So what you can, what we saw over here, that one feedstock through different approaches or a cascade of approaches, we obtained different products. So it's a kind of a biorefinery, say non-edible oil seed based biorefinery. So these are our, uh, you know, uh, 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 objectives of the present work. <clears throat> um, Biodiesel production from selected feedstock can correct us in biodiesel in blends, then engine performance test, then valoration of the byproducts as feedstock for biotic conversion to biodiesel, biofuel, assessment of insecticidal and herbicidal property of biodiesel byproduct, and the interrelation of byproducts of biodiesel that is biochar as a base material for catalyst preparation and its use in biodiesel production, which I have just now mentioned. So here there are different biorefinery approaches. I am just giving a hint of the different kind of biorefinery process depending upon what is your feedstock and then the process and then the intended products. So I'm not going into the details of the different biorefinery process, but you will get in literatures, the different types of uh, biorefinery process, which are, you know, the, the currently a hot cake in the uh, research domain. So uh, these are some of the works that has been carried out in the, uh, in the form of biodiesel production. Uh, there are a number of works that has been reported from our university department. I'm not going into the details, but what I can, what I say that biodiesel production is not a new thing, which has been investigated by a lot of researchers in the past, in the present, and will be in the future. So it's not a new thing. So engine performance test has also been done by many of the researchers throughout the world and in the sum also. Then pyrolysis of byproducts of biodiesel production has also been taken care of. Number of uh, workers have also, you know, uh, taken uh, the, the, the byproducts of uh, biodiesel production for pyrolysis, uh, uh, convert, pyrolytic conversion. Uh, so, uh, so number of researchers have also carried out bioefficacy tests using herbal mosquito repellents, even mosquito coil from dual seed cake of Karanja and Jatropha against uh, Abyss Egypt TLRV was also being taken care of or carried out. Acid catalyst from biochar for biodiesel production is also carried out. So what we can see over here is that almost all works are carried out in different manners. So different researchers or previous researchers have taken single piece of works, single piece of works in single different uh, from different uh, feedstocks. But here the, the beauty of our work is that we have taken one feedstock and we try to convert the uh, the, the original feedstock or original biomass into different products through a cascade of a process in a one set of experiment in a one uh, 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 portfolio. So uh, this is what we have done, non edible oil seeds, as I have already shown, non edible oil seeds to seed kernel, to vegetable oil, to biodiesel, uh, biodiesel, and then the dual seed cake, dual seed cake goes for mosquito repellent. Again, the dual seed cake and seed cover can be feedstock for pyrolysis. The pyrolysis will get char, bio oil, and biogas. The char can be utilized for solid acid catalyst, which is used again for replacing the inorganic catalyst for production of biodiesel. So we get, we uh, use different uh, cascade of process and we get different types of products. So here are the two uh, the species, uh, Cascabella trivetia, uh, the, uh, the common name is Corobi, Anasamese, and uh, in English, yellow oleander. 
uh, here some of the botanical description of the tree species. Here is Magnolia sampaka or Tita sapa in Assamese and Champak in English. And here some of the botanical descriptions. I am not going into the details of it. And this is the conventional methodology for biodiesel production and uh, oil extraction and biodiesel production. So, so you all know about it. I am not going into the details about it. This is the methodology for thermochemical conversion. So uh, the dried seed, seed cover and the dual seed cake, they are dried and grounded in the uh, thermochemical conversion of pyrolysis setup, uh, laboratory pyrolysis setup, uh, which where, uh, upon which we get the bio aqueous fraction and the biochar. <clears throat> so so this, these are the methodologies for the thermochemical conversion part. And then uh, let us go one by one part. We are going to discuss the four different parts of this work. So the, the first part, the conventional part, of course, the conventional part. Prasanta, I am audible, right? Yes, sir. Yes, it's going okay. fine. Okay, 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 okay. Okay, okay. thank you. Uh, my video is off, right? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> okay, okay, no problem, no problem, as you wish. Okay, no problem. Uh, here is the fatigue uh, profile of the, uh, you know, the Cascabella Tivedia. <coughs> the oil content of seeds uh, has been determined experimentally and found to be 62% and 42% weight by weight, respectively, for you know, uh, Cascabella Tivedia and Magnolia Sampaka. Uh, and then, uh, you know, the vegetable oil of Cascabella Tivedia contained around 35.30% saturated and 64.69% uh, unsaturated fatty acid. Uh, while Michaelia Champaka oil contained around 22.50% unsaturated oil and 77.50% unsaturated fatty acid. And it was observed that oleic acid in case of uh, 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 Cascabella tivetia was the major uh, domain constituent. And in case of uh, Magnolia Champaka, linolenic acid is the domain constituent of the uh, biodiesel. Uh, fatty acid profile, fatty acid profile. <clears throat> So in the next, uh, we have shown the proton NMR and 13 CNMR of the Cascavilla Tibetia and Magnolia Sampaka biodiesel. Uh, as you can see that the biodiesel NMR spectra, you know, uh, shows that the biodiesel is free from glycerol as no corresponding uh, signal of glycerol moiety appears in both uh, proton NMR and 13 CNMR of the Cascavilla Tibetia and Magnolia Sampaka biodiesel. So, uh, so as you can see over here, the fuel characteristics of the cascavilla activity and magnolia sampaka oil in biodiesel. So here you can see that different properties, different densities, kinematic viscosity, calorific velocity, and number acid value. So these different properties of biodiesel commonly characterized, uh, we have shown over here. So I'm not going into the details about it because you know the, uh, the you know, how the density kinematic viscosity, these, these properties are important. So I'm not going into the details of it. Uh, this is a comparison of properties of cascavilla activity and magnolia sampaka vegetable oil with similar non-edible uh, vegetable oils. Uh, here, from from this chart or from this table, you can conclude that both, uh, you know, cascavilla activity and Michaela champaka oil can be used for biodiesel production because they are uh, more or less similar to the the oils uh, of other trees which are which are uh, generally which are successfully you know utilized for biodiesel production. And uh, this is a uh, Comparison of properties of Cascavilla tibetia and Magnolia Champaka biodiesel with biodiesel obtained from similar non edible oil bearing tree species like Jatropha carcass, carcass, then Pungamia glabra, Terminalia bellarica, Sepindus mucurosi, Mesuoferia. So we have, these are the you know, established biodiesels. Uh, uh, biodiesel. So we have uh, uh, you know, compared the uh, biodiesels uh, from these two species, uh, from these two species uh, with the uh, other established biodiesels. And we can see over there. That properties of were comparable, and both uh, the biodiesel, uh, the cascavilla TVD and magnolia sampaka seeds are suitable feedstock for biodiesel performance. So here comes the engine characteristics. You know, uh, you know a number of researchers have, have already investigated the you know the, the different engine characteristics, and uh, they have concluded that biodiesel bands with diesel could be used in diesel engines without uh, any engine modification up to a certain uh, blending. The National Biofuel Policy of Committee of India also envisages blending of biodiesel with petrol diesel up to 20% by 2030. In this regard, we here in our uh, work, we took three blends, B10, B20, and B30. 
uh, from both the bioresults and investigated in the CI engine in terms of its engine performance and emission characteristics. You know, the brake torque uh, engine, uh, the engine torque variation with respect to the engine speed at full load condition for diesel, B10, B20, and B30 biodiesel brands of both uh, Tibetan and Champaka are uh, shown over here. It is observed that the engine torque increased with the engine speed until it reaches a maximum value and then started decreasing with further increase in increase uh, engine speed. At low speeds, the air fuel ratio remained richer due to lower vacuum of the cylinder and lower vaporization. And this results in incomplete combustion of the fuel and subsequently lower brake torque values for the engine. You know, uh, the brake power, uh, this figure uh, shows the uh, variation of brake power uh, with the engine speed for diesel and the uh, Cascabella Tibetia and Micronia Champaka biodiesel plants. The brake power increased steadily, almost, almost steadily with an increase in engine speed for all the tested fuels. The reduction in brake power for biodiesel plants compared to diesel is due to the due probably due to the lower calorific below and higher viscosity and density. Then the brake thermal efficiency, you know, uh, mm, uh, measures. We know that it measures the efficiency of conversion of chemical energy into useful energy work, and is inversely related to the brake specific fuel consumption. Uh, and this is critical parameter uh, in terms of determining the effects of various fuels on the engine performance. The high brake uh, thermal uh, efficiency of B10 blend was due to lower viscosity and increase in volatility compared to B20 and B30 blends. Then the brake specific fuel consumption is a uh, of a diesel engine depends on the relationship between volumetric fuel injection system, viscosity, density, and nitrating below. Uh, as you can see uh, from here, the BSFC decreased gradually and reached the lowest value at 3000 RPM and then increased with an increase in engine speed for all the blends in the study. This is due to the probably greater heat loss from the combustion chamber walls at lower speeds. Thus, combustion efficiency was poorer, causing the higher fuel consumption for the power produced. So uh, this is a carbon monoxide and uh, uh, carbon monoxide emission um, from both Caspula uh, Sivetia and Mycelia Sampaka. Uh, CO uh, formed as a result of, we know CO formed as a result of incomplete combustion and partial oxidation of the fuel. And it can be seen that for all the fuels, CO emission reduced when engine speed increased from 2000 to 3000 RPM. And then uh, it increased with an increase in engine speed from 3000 to 4000 RPM. Initially, an increase in speed increased the in cylinder temperature, which favored the CO oxidation. However, later on, at richer, uh, speed, higher, sorry, at higher speed, the time available for oxidation mechanism got reduced, resulting in an increase in CO emission. Uh, then the anox emission, um, the variation in anox emission in diesel and uh, C. tibetia and Mycenia Sampaka biodiesel blends with increased engine speed are shown over here. It is shown, it is observed that biodiesel blends uh, like B10, 20, and 30 showed higher NOx emission values compared to the diesel fuel. Also, uh, NOx emission increased with increasing engine speed for all the fuels. The higher certain number of biodiesel resulted in shorter ignition delay period, which in turn enhances the combustion efficiency of the biodiesel blends. And uh, moreover, the relatively higher oxygen content of the biodiesel also results in complete combustion of the fuel and higher combustion temperature, and which probably increase the NOx emission. Again, the, the viscosity of biodiesel is higher, higher, so probably that also lead to the injection of bigger droplet size and shorter ignition delay, which might also cause higher NOx emission. Further, uh, we must also keep in mind that the biodiesels are uh, of uh, plant origin or biological origin, and so they also contain the original nitrogen available in the plant. So therefore, also probably the NOx emission are, are higher in biodiesels. But then, however, uh, I must say that there are reports which also say that biodiesel anoxic emission from biodiesel blends are lower. So there are conflicting results about the uh, biodiesels. So anyway, <clears throat> so this is a summary of the first part. The properties of biodiesel uh, of these two uh, uh, oils are in conformity with ASTM and European standards. Engine performance and emission results shows that lower blends of B10 and B20 can be used in diesel engine without any engine modification. 
the brake torque, brake power, uh, brake terminal efficiency of the biodiesel bands were lower than diesel fuel, while the brake specific fuel consumption was higher in comparison to diesel fuel. So, so lower carbon emission while NOx emission increased compared to diesel fuel. And uh, they can be considered as suitable feed stock for biodiesel conversion. So come to the, let us come to the next part where we uh, do the thermochemical conversion of the DOL seed cake and DOL seed cake and the seed cover, uh, uh, or we can say the pyrolytic valorization of the, the waste products of the uh, biodiesel production. So here are the physical chemical characterization or uh, properties and the methods and apparatus used for the physical chemical properties, the experimental setup over here, the thermo, the, the laboratory uh, thermochemical conversion or thermo, the laboratory pyrolytic setup, uh, the dimensions of the reactor, the operating conditions, and the products are uh, shown over here. Then the, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> the physical chemical properties, uh, <clears throat> Uh, physiochemical properties of the CTDC, uh, CTSC uh, are uh, shown over here. Uh, the moisture content, you know, of a feedstock has significant effect on conversion efficiency of the pyrolysis process. That's very, very important. But interestingly, the, 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 both the, all the, the CTDC, CTSC, and MCDC. CTDC means Cascabella Tibetia DOL seed cake. CTSC means Cascabella Tibetia uh, seed cake, uh, sorry, uh, seed cover. And MCDC means Michaelia Sampaka uh, uh, DOL seed cake. So DC means DOL seed cake, C SC means seed cover. So these are CT and MCR, these are the two feedstocks. So these are the you know byproducts which are uh, uh, produced during the biodiesel production or waste products which are produced during the biodiesel production. So uh, now these are the feedstocks for thermochemical conversion. So we have seen that the, the these feedstocks, these waste products have a moisture content uh, less than you know or less than 5% or if, uh, almost uh, 5%. And they're, that's how they are very, very good for uh, you know, thermochemical conversion. <clears throat> Generally for thermochemical conversion, we say that a feedstock uh, should, be, should have less than 10%, uh, 10 weight percent uh, moisture content uh, to ensure rapid heat transfer rates in a pyrolysis reactor. Uh, then, you know, uh, it can also be observed that the biomass samples contain higher amounts of carbon and oxygen as compared to hydrogen. The lower amounts of nitrogen in the sample suggest that anoic emission would be lower and thus the environmental impact would be reduced. The higher amounts of hydrogen and oxygen compared to carbon reduces the energy content of biomass compared to the fossil fuels as lower energy is contained in carbon oxygen and carbon hydrogen bonds than the carbon carbon bonds. The MCDC biomass has a lower calorific value than the CTDC biomass which can be attributed to the higher OYC ratio of the MCDC and then the CTDC biomass. So, and then the comp compositional analysis like the lignin cellulose and hemicellulose, these are the major building blocks of, you know, uh, plant cellulose and that's how they are very, very important as far as their conversion to, conversion in pyrolysis is concerned. So, now let's see the thermal degradation or thermogrammetric analysis of the CTDC, CTS and MCDC uh, feedstocks. As you can see that we can see that there are three distinct stages if you can see, there are three distinct stages uh, uh, of uh, biomass degradation. <clears throat> and then the product yield, if you can look at the product yield, pyrolysis yield of the uh, uh, pyrolysis product yield of CTDC, CTS, and MCDC, uh, we can, it can be observed that we can increase in pyrolysis temperature from 400 to 600 degrees Celsius. The biochar yield decreased as the inorganic organic material present in biomass decomposes more at higher temperature, resulting in the release of volatile material. Then the bio oil yield increases corresponding to a rise in pyrolysis temperature from 400 to 500 degrees Celsius, while the yield decreases to the final temperature uh, at the final pyrolysis temperature of 600 degrees centigrade. The lower yield of bio oil at 400 degrees centigrade was due to the fact that at lower temperature, complete pyrolysis of biomass could not take place and thus yielding lesser amount of bio oil. However, at higher temperature also, the bio oil yield decreased due to the, you know, due to the uh, secondary tracking reactions of pyrolysis, uh, uh, pyrolysis gases, resulting in higher gas yield and subsequently the lower uh, yield of bio oil. So we uh, obtain higher bio oil yield at uh, 500 degrees Celsius. 
and therefore the uh, the bio oil obtained from the indigenous antiquity were taken for you no know, uh, further consideration so in the next slide we saw over here the physical chemical properties of the bio oils obtained from the three different feedstocks uh the elemental analysis of this uh, feedstock this carbon hydrogen and nitrogen uh, exhibits that oxygen content in bio oil is lower than that in the original biomass feedstock the significant decrease uh, in bio oxygen content in a bio oil is favorable uh, as higher oxygen content you know decreases the calorific value of the bio oil uh, further it can be observed that bio oils have higher carbon and hydrogen content compared to the original biomass feedstocks which indicates a higher uh, energy density of the bio oils the density of bio oil was found to be higher than that of the transportation fuels that is almost always a problem or limitation of the bio oil the higher density of bio oil adversely affects the pumping and injection of in an engine at lower temperature and thus the prospect of blending bio oils with transportation fuels needs to be you know explored no then uh, let's see the fta analysis of the the bio oil the fta i'm not going to the details but then fta analysis gives us an indication of the different types of chemical groups present in the bio oil as i have said earlier that bio oil is considered as the storehouse of different types of chemicals so if we can see over here the different types of chemicals are present in the uh, bio oils then uh, the <clears throat> proton nmr uh, the again the chemical complexity of bio oil uh, you know leads to the use of various analytical methods both chromatographic as well as spectroscopic and then uh, it is observed from the table that there are major differences in the overall chemical composition of the bio oil as indicated by the different portions of the spectra mm, then let us see the gcms analysis uh, gas chromatography mass spectroscopy analysis of the uh, bio oils as you can see there are again it reveals uh, the uh, presence of different types of chemicals but here we want to emphasize on uh, two different compounds uh, one is thymol and thymol and the other one is 8 methyl octahydrocoumarin so these are the two uh, important compounds that are observed in mcdc bio oil and they are found to possess various pharmacological properties and they are traditionally used traditionally used uh, traditional used in traditional medicines and uh, you know they have various important pharmacological properties like antioxidant anti inflammatory antiseptic so what you can say that they and can have uh, these bioels can also have biomedical applications now let's come back to come to the the, the biochar part the, the bio the solid liquid part we have taken care of the biochar uh, biochar part the characterization of the biochar part that uh, it can be observed that the moisture content of the biochars decrease with an increase in the pyrolysis temperature from 0.2 600 degrees celsius the i am i am only uh, talking about the major uh, points um then the, the oxygen content of biochar was less than the original feedstock and the carbon content is high uh, so there occurs a significant increase in calorific value of the biochars from the original biomass feedstock so uh, so that's an advantage <clears throat> uh Uh, again uh, the the ph of the biochar is increased with an increase in pyrolysis temperature the increase in ph may be due to the separation of alkali salts from the inorganic materials and biochar at a high ph may correct the soil acidity problem and can be used in a liming agent so biochar is you know as i have said already biochar can be used as a soil amendment uh, because it has got uh, you know uh, high ph um, again uh, it's a van kaplan diagram van kaplan diagram was plotted using the h by c and o by c ratios of ctdc ctsc and mcdc of uh, biochars obtained from uh, as obtained from the table the h by c and o by c ratios determine the degree of aromaticity then carbonation and maturation which can be represented by the van kaplan diagram as shown in figures uh, it was observed that it is observed that o by c and h by c ratios of biochars you know decreases with an increase in the pyrolysis temperature from 400 to 600 degrees celsius again the carbon sequestration potential of biochar as i have already said mentioned that biochar has got in immense uh, or numerous numerous uses biochar uh, uh, after production after produced from the uh, through the process process of chemical conversion or pyrolysis you know biochar retains the carbon and uh, of the original biomass Uh, almost 50% of the original carbon is retained in the biochar uh, almost 50% of the original bio, uh, carbon of the uh, feedstock or biomass retained in the biochar 
So this carbon, the most important part or sweet, uh, beautiful thing is that this carbon becomes so, you know, resistant to biotic and abiotic uh, degradation that it can stay in the soil for long, long periods of time. So that's the beauty of the biochar. You know, if you, if you, if you keep a, a piece of uh, biomass in the soil, the carbon content in the biomass will, you know, uh, get uh, degraded due to biotic and abiotic factors and it will, you know, uh, again, uh, get back to the atmosphere, right? In the form of carbon dioxide due to carbon mineral, carbon, uh, different processes. But then the carbon which is present in the biochar is so, you know, uh, resistant to the degradation by both biotic and abiotic factors that this carbon will remain as it is in the soil for even for thousands of years. There are examples from Brazil, which we call as terra preta soil. So there they found that carbon dating back to thousands of years, biochar carbon dating back to 10,000 years. So biochar is increasingly being seen as a, you know, material for carbon sequestration or eating the, 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 the so, this has been, you know, a hot topic now. Uh, carbon uh, biochar as a carbon biochar uh, as a carbon sequestration material. So in our studies also, we try to see the carbon sequestration potential of biochar. So uh, the higher CSP indicates, or carbon higher CSP means carbon sequestration potential indicates that the higher resistance of biochar against the biotic as well as abiotic degradation. They become resistant. Resistant. The uh, bi biochar carbon becomes resistant to biotic and abiotic uh, degradation, and that means they become recalcitrant. So, so the higher CSP indicates the recalcitrant uh, biochar carbon. The recalcitrant index, that is R50, evaluates you know, the biochar quality for carbon sequestration. It is made, measured by the relative thermal stability of a, of a given biochar to that of graphite. The CSP and R50 index of CTDC, CTSC, and MCDC biochars obtained at different temperatures are shown over here. The recalcitrance index increased with an increase in the pyrolysis temperature from 400 to 600 degrees Celsius. And this increase can be attributed to the increase in aromatic uh, carbon in biochar with temperature. Uh, and it was reported that the aromatized biochar can resist decomposition and develop into a recalcitrant one. Thus, the biochar could remain in soil for many years and could be a robust means of carbon sequestration. Again, we go for after. Hello. Hello.
Wait for some minute. Our speaker is joining soon. Hello, dear participants. It's extremely sorry for the inconvenience. Actually, problem arise from his side, the speaker's side. We are at the system here. It's okay. So he has apologized. So he'll be joining shortly. Please have patience.
Hello. Okay, sir. Got to get second. Yeah, yeah. You hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. <laughs> I'm going back again. Sorry for the disruptions. Okay, okay. It's scary. Yeah. Yeah. So the previous slide, we saw the same analysis. So here, the EDX analysis, the EDX spectrum of the CTDC, CTS, and MCDC biochars are shown over here. And, you know, uh, it gives us the EDX spectrum sp uh, specifically gives us the percentage composition of the elements present in the biochar surface. So, and then, uh, you know, uh, it is observed that biochar produced at higher temperature contained higher amounts of carbon to get a small percentage of oxygen. However, the hydrogen present in the biomass was not observed on the biochar surface, which may be released during thermal decomposition of biomass at 600 degrees Celsius. Then, you know, then let's go to the XRD analysis. The, the biomass crystallinity and the, and the structure of biochar can be studied with the help of uh, biochar, uh, sorry, the X-ray diffraction. I'm not going to the details of it. Then uh, the overall summary from this part is that uh, we got maximum bio yield of 29.11%, 26.18%, and 29.30%, less than 30%, of course, for all the uh, three uh, different feedstocks. Uh, at 500 degrees Celsius, with the heating at the 40 degrees centigrade per minute. Bio is so higher calorific value <clears throat> than the biomass. And then compounds like thymol and 8-methyl uh, octahydrocomarin. And they suggest that it can have biomedical applications. Biochar can, bio oil can be used as biochar, uh, biomedical applications. Then biochar with high pH can be used, used as a uh, use for correcting the soil acidity in the you know, no, uh, uh, in the P acidic soils of uh, acidic soils of uh, northeast India. <laughs> then the uh, third part of the uh, third part of the uh, work, uh, which speaks on uh, the dual seed kick to mosquito repellent. So we used uh, dual seed kick as a mosquito repellent. So let's start with the work. This the materials used are MCDC. Uh, uh, Michael H. Champata DOL cake and uh, uh, Cascavela Tibeta DOL cake. And uh, we took some other ingredients as well for preparing this uh, mosquito repellent. However, I'm not uh, divulging uh, the other ingredients because we are in the process of, you know, um, uh, filing something, uh, filing a uh, patent. We are thinking about a patent if we can. So I'm not, we are not divulging anything on this right now. So, uh, um, and we, we uh, the mosquito repellent that we were produced were, uh, uh, you know, used against uh, Aedes aegypti and Culex uh, mosquitoes. And then uh, the work was done uh, at uh, Defense Research Laboratory, laboratories, Defense Research Laboratories at Tejpur, which is near to our university. And then, uh, so uh, uh, they were found to be, you know, quite comparable to the uh, commercial coils. <clears throat> Here, the knockdown effects of mosquito repellents with uh, CTDC, MCDC, and CTDC plus MCDC. So, we took three combinations of the active ingredient that is CTDC, Cascabella Tivita DL cake, Michaela Sapaka DL cake, and CTDC and MCDC DL cakes in uh, one is to one proportion. And along with other ingredients, we tried to see their uh, knockdown effects of uh, these three combinations. And uh, here also the knockdown effects of uh, against the uh, Culex mosquito, Culex mosquitoes. Here the mortality of different concentrations of active ingredients against Aedes aegypti and Culex mosquitoes. So uh, the the most important part is that the, the summary of, from this work is that the bioefficacy results shows 63 and 71.25% mortality with KD50 values of 46.15 minutes, 60.41 minutes, and 57.14 minutes, respectively, for the mosquito repellents. Uh, containing 30% cascular tibetia and Michaelis of dual cake individually, and 35% in combination. The uh, mortality of these two mosquitoes were higher when CTDC and MCDC were used in combination uh, as active ingredients. <clears throat> the, the last part of this work is here, where we are using, we are, you know, uh, converting the char obtained in the process of pyrolysis uh, as into a solid acid catalyst. And this solid acid catalyst is being used to replace the organic, inorganic catalyst being used in the 
vegetable oil esterification and transterification to biodiesel. So the, this is the last part. <coughs> Sorry. So this is the methodology. Uh, the uh, dual seed cake and the uh, seed cover. Uh, again, we uh, uh, you know did pyrolysis. Uh, the, the 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 solid fraction you know they were sulfonated. Uh, sulfonation was done, and then we prepared the acid catalyst. And then the acid catalyst was used in the transtrification for production of biodiesel. I am not going into the details about the physicochemical properties of the biochars with different pyrolysis temperatures, but here in this uh, scheme of things, what we did, we produced the biochars at different heating durations of 60 minutes, 90 minutes, and 120 minutes. So these are the effect of heating duration and the pyrolysis temperature on biochar yield and pH. These are the properties of the biochars and CTDC biochar catalyst. And uh, this is the analysis of the catalyst. Now, this is the conversion rate. Uh, after using the biochar catalyst, we have biochar sulfonated catalyst. In the first cycle, we got 90.5% conversion. Uh, and then the second, uh, we got 85.7%. In the third, we got 78.5%. Of course, it uh, reduced to 58.4% in the fifth cycle. However, in the first three cycles, we got very good results. Uh, so uh, that's how we can say that the, the, the biochar turned sulfonated catalyst can be used as a you know, can be used to replace the inorganic catalyst in the esterification and transtrification of biodiesel production. Uh, so the, the summary from this section is that the solicit catalyst uh, derived from CTDC biochar showed excellent catalytic activity and stability in biodiesel production. A maximum biodiesel yield of 90.50% was obtained when the transtrification was carried out at 85 degrees centigrade with methanol to oil ratio of 9 is to 1 and the catalyst weight of two weight percent at reaction time of two hours. So most importantly, a new environmentally benign catalyst has been derived from the byproducts of biodiesel production, which can be used in the production of biodiesel. And this is important in the context of overall economy of the biodiesel production, that catalyst produced for the biochar can be a viable option. So the conclusion that uh, can be made from the, this work is that, uh, I have listed some of the conclusions from the, this work, but then, most importantly, uh, the one thing I'd like to say that, uh, you know, a single, uh, you know, piece of biomass or any feedstock or any, uh, you know, bio, bio waste can be converted to different, you know, uh, products, uh, not only energy products, but also other products uh, of general use, maybe materials, energy materials, or different other chemical, uh, chemicals or materials, and the, the biofuels, different products that can be obtained. Uh, you know, uh, uh, with a cascade of approaches, because to utilize the all the chemical groups in a particular feedstocks, we need to take into account. Uh, we can we need to take into a, we need to employ different you know uh, uh, cask different approaches so that each and every chemical group that is present in the feedstock is properly utilized. So this is my conclusion from this uh, uh, this work. And I believe uh, any kind of feedstock you work for, you know, uh, uh, biomass conversion, uh, you need to. We need to think about that. Uh, the all the uh, all the chemical groups of the biomass has needs to be, you know, converted to different products with zero waste. Yes. That should be the, you know, kind of that is the, you know, the concept of biorefinery. And uh, I believe the uh, 2G biorefinery is going to be very very popular in the coming days. And in this context, the, the, the ethanol biorefinery that is coming up in the NRL, uh, Numolecular Refinery Limited, you must have heard about it. So uh, that is uh, going to be uh, viable uh, within a few years' time. So I believe the biorefineries will be a viable option in the days to come. Uh, with that, uh, I conclude. Uh, thank you uh, for your patient hearing. I'm sorry for the disruptions uh, in between. Uh, that is probably from my end. I'm sorry for that. Uh, and then I uh, thank uh, the coordinators, uh, Prashant Choudhury and then uh, Dr. Bharat Kakati, and then all the uh, the, the, office, uh, the organizers of this uh, webinar series for kindly inviting me to this uh, webinar and giving me a chance to uh, present our work before you. I hope you are benefited by uh, our work 
and uh, you will also take up uh, some kind of work on biomass conversion and biorefinery, which I believe is very, very important for our future generation. With that, I conclude. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Kotoki, sir. It was a very valuable talk and informative talk that we have placed today. And I think definitely, I'm quite definite the students and the, all the faculty members, the research scholars, they'll be benefited from this talk. Now, there are some few queries. If you can uh, permit, we can take them. Yeah, yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Now, one question from Ankuman Sharma. He is saying, asking, what are the impacts of the growing biofuel crops on farmers? On? On farmers. Farmers. On farmers, yeah, that's what, that's what. Uh, but on the farm. I believe uh, okay. uh, farm, farmers, yeah, farmers, uh, uh, you know, commercial scale uh, uh, biofuel production uh, has not much come up in this, in our country. Uh, in introduction, then all, in some places, uh, they have tried uh, with, uh, with uh, reference to Jatropha Karkas, but uh, commercial scale biofuel production hasn't come up. And again, you know, uh, using farmland for uh, growing biofuel crops is, a, uh, is not possible in our country. So that's how probably we are more concentrated on, you know, lignocellulosic feedstocks, which are mostly the bio wastes. We have huge amount of bio waste, and I believe the bio, if we can utilize the bio waste properly, I believe that will, you know, be uh, at least, uh, you know, sufficient uh, if we can utilize the, uh, the bio waste. We have agricultural bio waste, which are being, you know, in Punjab and Haryana, you must know the agricultural waste or a crop uh, residues are burned every year, creating havoc in Delhi. So if we can utilize those bio residues and if we can residue and one major, you know, uh, feedstock is the, you know, the organic part of the municipal solid waste. So the organic part of the municipal solid waste is huge, is huge, you know, it's enormous. And then, and then that is increasing day by day, increasing day by day. So if we can get, utilize that, I believe that will be, you know, very, very useful. Okay. So another question uh, is from uh, Kamal Talukdar. He is asking uh, how we can discover non-edible oil seeds for biofuel production in a new place. How we can discover? Non-edible oil seeds for biofuel production in a new place. Yeah, but, but, but you have to be a little inquisitive about this. You have to take the help of a botanist. <laughs> you have to take the help of a botanist because when we inventorized around 48 different tree species in Assam and Onarchal Pradesh, we really took the help of local people because I may not identify a tree species, right? The local people, uh, the indigenous <laughs> community, they are you know better informed about it. They know which tree species has got what uh, you know, utility, you know? Uh, so we took the help of, uh, I cannot give you a direct answer, but I can give you what we did for inventorizing 48 different tree species in Assam and Arunachal Pradesh. So we took the help of uh, the local communities. We tried to, you know, understand their botanical description. We took the help of a taxonomist, so who can identify the tree species. And then after identifying that, that yes, this is a, this, this tree, this is a, uh, such, this tree species. And then we tried to collect the seeds. We tried to, uh, you know, find out their oil content. Yeah, up to this much only we have uh, done till now. But then later on, we also need to, you know, find out the quality of the oil. So this is what you have to, uh, that's how you have to start the process. Nobody, is, there is no, you know, clear cut procedure for identifying, and identifying a new species. You know, okay. it all depends upon your inquisitiveness and your interaction with the local community. Okay, actually we are running out of time. Uh, the second speaker is already ready. So the last okay. two questions, so last two questions, sir, I'm taking last two queries. The one is asking, sir, can you please say about Van Kravlin diagram and what information yes. can we get from it? Yeah, Van Kravlin diagram, you know, it, it, it gives us a, you know, uh, I can show you Van Kravlin diagram. It, uh... <clears throat> yeah, here was a Van Kravlin diagram. So it gives us a information about the, uh, you know, the position or the, you know, the, this is, uh, the H by C ratio against O by C ratio. So uh, if we can, you know, uh, the, all the different types of fuels, solid fuels can be plotted in this H by C ratio and O by C ratio. So in this Van Krebden diagram, we can find out where the, where is the position of our feedstock. 
right in comparison to uh, the solid fuels other solid fuels for example coal lignite bituminous coal or other uh, solid fuels or biomass where, where is our position so that kind of information is given by the van kelvin diagram okay so sir thank you very much uh, it's a big pleasure to have you today yeah thank you for the lecture so and yeah yeah it's convey my rigors and the heartfelt thanks sir from the team of the utbp 2030 and also from the mechanical department and as well as the astu okay sir we'll be meeting you soon okay thank you so much thank sir thank you. thank you thank you thank you so much thank, thank you for your patient hearing <laughs> i'm again i'm sorry again for the uh, disruption in between it's okay sir it's okay 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 <laughs> not a problem thank at you. all okay thank you sir thank yeah, you so thank much thank you so much thank you okay. bye, bye. now we are having the next uh, uh, speaker the mr dr biplop das from nit silchar uh, so now i ask request bidisha to give the introduction about him and to start bidisha sir yes sir okay thank you for your informative lecture sir yeah, now yeah. i'd like to introduce you the second lecture of the session dr biplop das assistant professor stop, stop national sharing. assistant professor national institute of technology silchar dr das had completed his btech from neri titanagar and mtech from nit silchar in thermal engineering in 2014 he was awarded with phd in the field of heat transfer dr das has started his professional career as an assistant professor at cit kokrajhar and currently serving as same at nit silchar during his post of reachers he was awarded with the prestigious bhaskara advanced solar energy fellow award by indo us science and technology forum and department of science and technology gov of india dr das has published numerous amounts of national and international journal papers and reviewed more than 15 international journal papers we are happy to have you among us sir now i request dr biplop das sir to share his valuable words on advances in production and uses of biodiesel as an alternative fuel over to you sir uh thank you bidisha uh, uh, i think i am audible yes sir yes okay. sir yes yes yeah uh, first uh, i would like to express my sincere gratitude to assam engineering college and uh, coordinator of this program webinar uh, prashant kumar choudhury sir for giving me the opportunity to share my this one uh, little expertise with the august gathering uh, only thing is that before me the speaker was uh, was uh, almost like a my teacher was a very this one, renowned person in this field of biofuel so i i have attended his lecture and uh, i could see many of the things which i have prepared is already being uh, this one uh, uh, shared by him so anyway i'll try to uh, skip some of the things which he has already covered uh, is my screen visible to you people yes sir yes sir yes sir okay so uh, i thought of giving my presentation i thought of giving my presentation on advances in production and uses of biodiesel as an alternative fuel presently i am working as bidish has already introduced as an assistant professor in department of mechanical engineering and it shells my presentation will consist of uh, my research team uh, different funding agency from which i have received uh, fund and read of renewable energy resources introduction to biofuel scope of biofuel in india biofuel production procedure use of biodiesel as an alternative fuel in ic engine and some scope and uh, proud in the this one, data whatever the references i have used uh, i did as already told that we, i have a joint collaboration with uh, alster university uk and uh, university of idaho usa uh through which uh, with whom i am uh, this one pursuing my research this is my research group uh, though i could not accommodate all few are left so you can see most of the uh, candidates or the scholars they are working on uh, uh, solar energy and wind energy and one student he is working on nano fuel but uh, i am closely involved with other of my colleague from the nit silchar who are working on uh, biofuel uh for uh, this one uh, i received these funds from different organizations uh, 
like DST, SCRB, IUS, TF, Ministry of Environment, Forest and Climate Change, then uh, CPRI, Department of Biotechnology, Government of India. So with fund from this, I have started developing my lab uh, at energy shelter and it is, and my introduction to this field of biofuel has started from Nerist where we have developed a, a, this one, a, the demonstration center and established a biodiesel laboratory which can produce a 300 liter uh, per day capacity of biodiesel uh, way back in 2007. Uh, at that time, as uh, Kokotisar has already mentioned, the biofuel mission was in full swing mode and uh, we have developed lab over there. And uh, then after coming at Energy Shelter recently, we got project from S DST an SCRV under which we are trying to develop or use biofuel along with uh, this one, nano endotips and hydrogen. So, but uh, since today's lecture, I kept myself within the limit of biodiesels with inclusion of nano fuel. So uh, I'll try to brief the introduction part in which like why we want to move to renewable energy. We all know that two factor one is there is a lack of resources in case of biofuel. Uh, or, or sorry, conventional fuel or petroleum fuel, and it is diminishing day by day one side. On the other side, there is environmental issues with the burning of this biofuel, uh, conventional fuel. Thus, we can see that we are having, uh, trying to move from a conventional mode to a non-conventional mode, like hydrocarbon, solar energy, biomass, wind, geothermal, okay? So these are the things with which we move. Then just brief idea, like by 2040, you can see that our energy demand will be uh, increasing very high. And what are the so this one project projection is that we can see that uh, requirement of coal and requirement of total liquid, natural gas, renewable energy. So if we consider 2020 renewable energy is uh, maybe and this one expecting to increase by fivefold. Okay. So basically there is a scope now. Why? Because other sources will diminish. Then in India, if we see, we can see that India's coal fleet has more than tripled since 2000 and plans for further expansion could have big implication of global emission. How? Because the burning of coal is a big issue in thermal power plant on the one side. Another side, if we keep on digging the coal or taking out from the ore, then what will happen? We need to fill it up. Otherwise, a lot of uh, this one, natural calamities will come. Like for example, there's a huge chance of earthquake. And when you take out the coal, the quality of coal in India is very poor in most of the part. So if you burn that, it's a big emission issue. Then if we see the, in the previous slide, we have seen that uh, what are the sources? Now, what are, why are we are using that uh, resources, energy sector wise? Uh, you can see that Transport in 2020, it is uh, whatever the magnitude it is, it's almost going to uh, increase by two or two, three fold by 2035. That means uh, by 2035, our requirement for in transport section is going to increase compared to the other sector where it is also increasing. So basically, in my presentation of today's area where I have kept concentrated is transport sector. So in the transport sector means I have to use and that uh, alternative fuel as a transport fuel. So transport fuel means I want as a replacement of petrol or a diesel, okay? And what are the sources I have? Next, recently we have uh, passed the day 10th August. What is that? This is uh, known as World Biofuel Day in India. Uh, and for India this, this year, our, our aim or the mission was biofuel towards Atmanirbhar Bharat. That was the biofuel day uh, so thought of mm -hmm. India. So awareness about the what awareness of the importance of non-fossil fuel is an alternative to conventional fossil fuel. That is, we have to pass the information as mass as possible to uh, encourage the people to go or move themselves towards the non-fossil fuel. In India, uh, basically, they are producing world's third largest emitter of greenhouse gas, that is, which is in 2019, and trans in transport sector accounts for. 13% of the country's energy related CO2 emission. So you can see we are third in the world and our total CO2 emission, 13% of that is coming from the uh, transport sector. Thus, transport sector plays a big role. Then already uh, the last speaker has introduced, but still just for the sake of 
information what is biofuel solid liquid or gas is biogas liquid is bioethanol or biodiesel solid is wood dry plant materials manure these are the these are the things which we can uh, we, we can be used and <clears throat> now what are the this one uh, classification of liquid bio, this one liquid biofuels uh, we can see that uh, there are basically generation wise we can half classify them first generation is sugar starch vegetable oil animal so this first generation basically is sold on the basis of source the second generation we try to produce it from the agriculture residue hardwood forest residue municipal solid waste and dedicated energy crop and then people have come across okay now we'll go for third generation in which basically algae and micro algae can be used and in fourth generation vegetable uh, oil or biodiesels but uh, again i am telling that when you talk about india and biodiesel we have to also rethink about our population and the food security point of view does whatever uh, the source which is available to other countries uh, may not be suitable for our country so we have to search a proper alternative then biofuel production by country was if you see we can see that biofuel accounted just for 3.5% of global road transported fuel that means we can see that the, out of the total uh, transported fuel only 3.5% has been used by the biodiesel uh, biofuel in the year of your around in the year of 2014 and if you see the ethanol ethanol production uh, we can ethanol india is only 1% whereas uh, if you see what biodiesel you see top 10 countries produce 82% so the percentage wise india is very less that's why it's not coming in a top 10 so in a whereas in case of ethanol we can produce it. but ethanol you see uh if we see the demand that we in in the year of biodiesel emissions 2007 then people have targeted okay we will be replacing 30 20% so if we want to really want to uh, replace the commercial fuel or the petroleum fuel with 20% so what we need we need a big quantity of uh, this one uh, fuel so can you think of ethanol so ethanol basically in india it is the world's second largest producer of sugarcane and major major manufacturer of molecular based derived ethanol that is ethanol derived from uh, this sugarcane is the main source is india but on the other side remember that sugarcane is mostly used for our food purpose the juice we take when we make sugar from that similarly gasoline demand will increase from 14.2 billion liters to 2010 to 45.6 billion liters in 2030 so gasoline demand is increasing so basically if we want to replace it uh, handsome amount of percentage by ethanol we need big quantity so basically still there is a scope now if we want to similarly replace the uh, biodiesel what might be the expected result in this one demand you can see that demand for diesel for transport sector is expected to grow from 46.9 billion liter in 2002 to 155.7 billion liters in 2030 similarly expected biodiesel demand if you consider the plan that we have made for 20% blending it is expected to grow for 31.1 billion liters in 2030 so that is this much amount of uh, this one biodiesel we will be requiring if we want to go for 20% plan so is it feasible that the plan that we have considered that we will achieve a 20% replacement by first generation first generation is basically here i am indicating the ethanol part which is extracted from the sugar cane so since the development and promotion of biofuel in india 20% blend seems remote is not possible what are the constraint because most of the state of the existing infrastructure and institutions so we cannot certainly change all the infrastructure and institutional setup and production is limited to first generation biofuel namely molar Uh, molasses derived ethanol and tree burning oil seed biodiesel basically since this is the co source that basically we have to rethink and parallelly as i said that we have a huge population we are second highest population country uh, uh, this one in india so uh, we have to concerns about food security at the same time land use so these are the constraint now what are the uh, things that we can we can sort out 
we can see that direct benefits of biofuel are linked to indirect impact that may adversely affect the greenhouse gas emission, ecosystem, and food and water security. So, what is the solution? Solution is we have to choose a target a degraded lens. We have to create rural employment in improving energy security. Thus, as I say, our this year's missions on biofuel day was to become an Atman Environment. So here, basically, if we use a degraded lens to uh, for uh, biodiesel production, then it is useful. It, that can uh, help us to generate rural employment. At the same time, it, it can help us to improve our energy security. So these two things are the important things through which we can solve our problem and we can achieve our goal. Now, <clears throat> let us see what is the potential. We have the potential to produce ethanol, which is by 2030, we are expecting that we'll be able to produce almost like uh, 15 uh, billion liters of ethanol. Thus, if we can produce 15 billion liters, we can see if the share is 20%, we will probably will able to match. And in other year also, you can see that the 2015 gap is my much high, 2015 gap is there. 25, by 30, probably we'll reach the gap if we want to replace 20%. That means that, means that if, we, if we can produce ethanol in sufficient quantity, we'll able to uh, reach this gap and we'll be able to uh, meet the our target 20% blending. But again, ethanol production mostly from sugarcane in the in the present situation. If we can come out with some other source from where we can extract, then we, there is a scope. Or if we can for uh, this sugarcane production, if we can use some degraded land if it is possible at all, then that is, that is can be achieved. Whereas now see about biodiesel. <clears throat> in 2007 or around nine, it has started. It was a that will be will be reaching the target. But what was our target? Our target was to reach 30, 20 percent uh, this one blending. But you see, whatever the projection now by 2030, we will be producing around 5 point something billion, maybe 5.1 or 5.2 billion liters of biodiesel. But that will able to replace only 3 percent. Thus, the question remains same: whether we'll have the opportunity to replace 3 percent this one. We'll able to replace only 3 percent of biodiesel. Thus, it may not be this one, uh, suitable, whatever we have planned. So we have to search for alternatives that, okay, if it is only 3%, what we can do, what effort we can make so that we can uh, go it at least beyond three and our target was 20% by 2030. So, but what is feasible? Only 3% replacement is feasible. Now, uh, uh, Professor Rupam sir is already uh, this one, uh, shown different sources of biodiesel and his presentation was, uh, mix up with all the figures that is possible in Northeast. He has done a lot of work, I know. So, uh, but here what I did, uh, I just try to this one, uh, collect the information and uh, gist of all the possible biodiesel sources people have used. And I also, uh, this one, seeing the question that has been uh, put by in the chat box by different uh, participants, like how we'll know whether any biodiesel, any seeds is non-edible or not. Of course, edible or non-edible, you have to take help from the forestry people or chemistry people or biotechnology people, they're able to help you. But if any any fuel seeds you take, if you see it's burning, you're able to know that, okay, if whatever is burning, there is a source of oil is there. Okay, that's why it's burning or it's a uh, this hydrogen content is there. So that is the main, main important point. How will extract that are the different processes through which you can extract. But <clears throat> this, you can see that, here some example of this one, edible oil people have used. So I have just uh, seen the cashew nut, coconut, corn, most of the things are known to you. But we, whether we are in a position to afford this, again, food security part is com coming to the picture. But when you talk about non edible oil, in India, mostly people have uh, concentrated on the Jatropa carcass. And in northeastern part, we have a, this one. <coughs> Uh, we have a mohua seeds and karanja seeds up to some limit is available and some part of uh, this one. Uh, Tripura, we have a huge quantity of rubber production. That's will rubber, then uh, mohua, karanja, these are the things and jatruba, a part of uh, is, uh, uh, people have done some, this some plantation. So these are the seeds which is known to us. Uh, if, you have, if you get a new seed, you want to try, these are the seeds which, which is people have already tried, you can try something extra. You can try something extra, you can get a, get a, this one, 
new seeds you try to explore and there are different standard methods through which you can measure the properties and you can claim that okay these are the things with which we can we can uh, see whether that is possible as a biodiesel or not then waste oil also people have tried like animal uh, fat or tallow then biomass pyrolysis chicken fat uh, poultry fat fish oil cooking oil. this is the waste oil people have uh, used and it's so in now <coughs> people have now coming up with synthetic cell electro biofuel photo photobiological solar biodiesel and people also coming across nowadays with plastic fuel okay so these are the things to which pe what people are trying to this one get but in any condition they are trying to extract the liquid part through different processes okay now what are the benefits and limitation of alternative fuel of different generation uh, we can <clears throat> see the first generation is, is easy biodiesel conversion and uh, easy availability of crops uh, what are the drawbacks effects on food supply low crop yield limited area of cultivation less adaptability of crop to environmental conditions these are the drawbacks in the second generation there is no effect on uh, food supply because mostly non edible part we are considering here this stock can be grow in a non uh, non degradable land uh, this one, uh, degradable land which is not used and less production cost uh, what the, what are the drawbacks drawbacks less effective cost effective conversion technologies low crop yield for some fish stock and in third generation we have a waste food oil uh, can be used for biodiesel production growth rate of lg is high it can be used in the third generation no effect on food supply it can be used sea water or waste water for lg growth this lg is one of the source in the third generation so the drawbacks high energy consumption for lg if you see for go for lg cultivation and uh, uh, yield, yield percentage of lg is very less that's why it's very 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 costly so uh, if, even if you get a source uh, which might not be plenty in production we may not just claim it that whether we will do it for laboratory experiment okay you will, you will use these and that maybe 5 ml 10 ml also you can extract you can uh, test the uh, properties and you can claim okay this is may be possible to survive but uh, when you when you really go to the practical field we have to come out of the lab scale we have to see or there is a scope for uh, scope for production or this uh, commercial scopes are there or not okay Then last one on the fourth generation, which is more lipid content, more CO2 absorbing ability, high energy content, rapid growth rate, uh, drawbacks is high initial investment, and research on intensive level. So that means still we are in research level in fourth generation and third generation in the market. If you go and see LG is coming up, everybody is saying LG, but in percentage is less, so cost of production is still very high. If you go to the second generation when uh, when i was in early stage of my this one research career there we have seen that uh, our um, biodiesels we produced from jatrova and jatrova seeds are 60 to 70 rupees kilo which we bought it from south india and 60 to 70 rupees kilo then you will get a yield percentage of 30% then what is what is the rate so raw rate is going very high per liter okay and at that time diesel was maybe around for uh, 50 or something like that so thing is that we have to have a we put a vision like we thought of 20% but till 2030 we can achieve up to 3% of that scopes is there so what we people being a research uh, early career research we can search proper alternative or other sources for more which can extend uh, let us see actually there are a lot of um, production procedures uh, but i escaped since uh, rupam sir has and delivered this one elaborately explained the many, many of the process i kept myself limited with the transistor irrigation process here you can see we have used honge seeds so we have oil expeller oil oil expeller from which we will get the extract the oil you can see the oil is coming out here now we are coming to transistor irrigation process now i just give a pause so this is a chemistry involved over here transistor irrigation because whatever the raw oil we get this raw oil cannot be used because in most of the cases especially the non edible oil their ffa value is very high free fatty acid content is very high that this uh, triglyceride it needs to be converted okay so what we do we we'll go for transesterification process in transesterification what we do we add uh, 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 alcohol and we add some catalyst it may be base catalyst may be acid catalyst depending on the ff value we will we'll go for this one we'll go for transesterification process then we we'll put it from uh, this one uh, 
or settle down, we'll get this uh, glycerin on the bottom and biodiesel on the top. Just you know. That's basically. Then we can see we are we are we are getting getting some uh, some samples. So we have a hunger well, we have a hunger biodiesel with helium color, and we have we got a uh, glycerin. So and uh, basically this is the final stage. In between, we need to do, do the washing part to remove any uh, contaminants with that, and we need to dry up to remove the uh, remove the water part. Uh, these are the things. Then finally, we have received the samples. Then uh, I try to this one um, make a tabular form in which basically we can uh, use these. What are the people have used with different oil so that you can find out uh, that what are the governing parameters people have used. You can see that the governing parameter in case of transesterification process is alcohol type and catalyst use, then catalyst amount, molar ratio of alcohol to oil, reaction condition, biodiesel yield. So the reference, okay? So uh, what, what you, can, you can do, like see any oil, if you take from this, you can get an idea. In most of the cases, alcohol is methanol that we use. And that's why whatever the final, mode, final uh, this one, sample of biodiesel we, we come out, with, we, can, we also call it as, as methylated stuff. Then, Sometimes people use base catalyst, sometimes use acid catalyst, maybe NaOH, KOH is the more famous, and H2SO4 is specifically acid catalyst. And sometimes also we may need, need to go for double stage. Double stage means uh, if FFA value is very high, we use uh, transesterification, then esterification, then we, we redo the, on this one, uh, re repeat the experiment in the following the process of esterification, transesterification. So if the refer value is very high, then we may need to go for this. In catalyst amount, catalyst, the role of the catalyst is to expedite the process, okay? Then molar ratio to alcohol, alcohol take part to convert the triglycerides, okay? Triglycerides, and this is the range like 6.1 to some people also use 40 to one. I don't know, I don't think it's right. Generally, if you, if you take a thumb rule, it's around 10 to one molar ratio, uh, like uh, uh, molar ratio of alcohol to oil. So alcohol to oil is 10 is to 1 something like that. And reaction condition, 60 to 80 degrees the temperature. Now 60 to 70 people generally keep and they go for either 180 minute or 120 minutes. So upper range is 120 to 180 minutes, they go for it. And yield percentage, that is, this is yield percentage is basically whatever the uh, vegetable oil you put and what is the biodiesel you have got. So this always 80 percent, 80%, but you have to reconsider if you see that, how much uh, oil seed you have put and how much oil um, uh, biodiesel you get. We know that uh, oil extraction is a uh, key parameter and oil percentage generally vary to 30 to 50 percent. Okay, even less than that also, if the oil seed has not been connected and is collected in a proper time. Thus, basically, we can see that total per yield percentage will be less if you come, if here the biodiesel yield percentage is considering how much raw oil has been given. But how much raw oil, uh, this one, from the seed, how much, uh, or the tree borne oil, uh, how much it, we can extract from a seed, that, that plays a big role. Then a non-catalyst use for biodiesel production. Now I'm just coming to this part and you just try to understand. In the previous case, whatever I have discussed, there the catalyst is base catalyst or acid catalyst is a traditional process. But people have uh, seen that uh, not only base or acid catalyst may not be giving the suitable pa performance, then people come up, no, we have to use some other catalyst. Okay, solid catalyst they have to start like calcium oxide, COL, aluminum oxide, lithium, C, uh, uh, lithium, uh, calcium oxide, these are the things. The alcohol to oil ratio is 12 is to 1, temperature 65, reaction type 120. And then catalyst is uh, white percent is five, and we are getting 19. So we have a better yield percent nanoparticle people have started using. Okay, different nanoparticle. And more advantageous is that in in this uh, presentation also we will include that how nanoparticle is playing a role in case of combustion. Okay, before we go for that, in case of extraction, it it is found that the yield percent is increase almost 15 to 40 percent if we use a nano catalyst. So nano catalyst uh, take uh, compared to normal catalyst, nano catalyst take part, it mix up with the uh, this one uh, reaction and 
it helps to enhance the yield percentage. And they will, even if they remain there, they will able to take part in the conversion. Now, while you are choosing a catalyst or nano catalyst, if you feel that, okay, I'll not, I'll not remove it, let it be there with the uh, final, final biodiesel sample, you have to choose such a, a catalyst which will not take part in the reaction or which will not be harmful to you. So choice of a proper, proper catalyst and you are, before you make a claim, laboratory place claim is no problem. You can, you can go for it. But again, we have to think that we are, we are doing the research in such a way that it can be commercialized. It, it, is, it has a practical value. Let us, as I said that in today's presentation, we'll try to, uh, this one, we'll try to uh, in, in, incorporate or try to highlight that how we can engine perform, will perform in presence of nano additive, okay? So here, uh, you can see the people have done both with diesel and Jetrofa, uh, diesel or biodiesel as a base fuel. This is the engine type operating condition I've considered. Then it's like aluminum, iron, bromium, aluminum, aluminum, iron oxide. Okay, the range is 40, 80, 50. Yeah, they are random, you know. In most of the cases, since what is the um, this one? thing is nano, whenever we say we are doing work on nano, it's a lucrative, whatever they feel like somebody has done, some value, even as you can see, these papers are not published in a bad journal, they are published in a good journal. They've used a 50 mm, direct one below they've used. Uh, what is the performance coming, engine performance? They are just showing it and publishing the paper. Okay. Similarly, use of antioxidant. Like uh, previously, I have considered only nano. Now, if, if asked or people that why people are using nano, uh, hardly you will get answer. You, they will say that no, they will improve the combustion. But nano particle, any nano particle like graphene, uh, this one, uh, uh, thin layer graphene, or maybe this one, uh, aluminium, or any copper oxide or aluminium oxide. Not aluminum oxide, aluminum, if you consider copper, if you consider, they have the capacity to take uh, part in to transfer heat fast so they can enhance the combustion rate will come to heat. But in the whatever the previously seen that whatever the uh, nanoparticle they've used in most of the paper, this is done by engineering background people, they just use it and they have also have not used any uh, particular reason. They have not, most of the cases, they just added some amount of uh, nanofuel, they just publish the paper. Then uh, some people have also tried that, uh, you know, if we store the biodiesel continuous uh, reaction process, oxidation process used to go on. Now, if we add the antioxidant, what happened? It's, it, it's performed better. People have found that, uh, you know, that uh, there are oxygen in case in the biodiesel, if we use antioxidant, that free bio, uh, oxygen available in the biodiesel is supposed to be absorbed by this antioxidant and thereby they will perform better. It will help to enhance the engine performance, okay, and emission analysis, combustion analysis. And so people have used uh, nano, uh, this one, antioxidant like uh, B, um, BHT, BHT, these, these are uh, typically available and any chemistry people, if we approach them, they'll be given. Now, what new thing you can do? This antioxidant, which is which is available here, they are not natural in nature, okay? So if any, uh, any you can take any engineering fellow or any chemistry people or biotechnology people, they, if they can take or identify some natural source of antioxidant which can be can be used as a uh, this one uh, as, a, as a catalyst for biodiesel production at the same time this can be uh, allowed to remain with the biodiesel and uh, which will take part in the uh, combustion like combustion or during the within the engine so this will be a very good one like that is like you are identify a single natural antioxidant which will not harm the environment so it will be environmental friendly, it is natural in nature. Then even if it remain with the biodiesel, it will initially during the transistor reduction process, it will help to enhance your, uh, uh, enhance your uh, this one, yield percentage, better yield will come. Then it will remain with there, it will take part in the combustion, it will enhance the combustion, it will give better performance, it will be less emissive in nature. So if you can identify such, such uh, this one, antioxidant, which is natural in nature, will be very good one. So as I, I said that, uh, uh, even if we talk about theoretical things, we, I just want to show a uh, uh, case study where basically our, our co-research, co-colleague in our mechanical department of energy research, they have done some work. So uh, we have started uh, this one. Uh, they have published the work in very good journals in which basically they have used iron as a nano -energy. With, and they have used uh, edible uh, biodiesel palm. Palm as an edible biodiesel they have used and they have shown. 
not only iron here the iron results of iron nanotubes and palm biodiesel i'll be discussing also they have tried with other uh, nanoparticle like graphene so uh, i already uh, told about that how how we can produce biodiesel okay preparation so here is a raw diagram so you can see that uh, i have a palm oil uh, maybe 10 liter this is available at another shelter we have a reactor which capacity of 15 liters so we put 15 10 liter of palm oil and we heated it up now oil reactor you know to maintain the reactor temperature we have to have a condenser which will continuously uh, condense the uh, vaporized form of oil and this condenser will sorry this condenser will help us to uh, keep the temperature maintain the temperature then you, you can see we have we used the methanol and uh, this as a alcohol kos as a a catalyst you mixer we have a, uh, the reactor is done then separator and water washing then drying then we will get the biodiesel we got biodiesel of 82% yield we have received then we again here basically the nanoparticle that has been used is iron nanoparticle and uh, graphene both, both the things has been procured from a uh, commercial supplier uh, of uh, this one uh, commercial supplier has supplied the fuels we just take it from them and uh, this is the characteristics we have not measured they just got it so if uh, any chemistry people or biotechnology people they are making their own nanoparticle they have to go for this morphology and then purity average particle size bet bulk density appearance and then sub, um, role of a surfactant i'll come to it the surfactant later before that uh, basically what are the nanoparticle that you have produced you have to prove that you have to do the characterization part so scope of chemistry people material science people are there or basically you can characterize the uh, characterize uh, uh, nanoparticle maybe natural one and you will use it as a uh, as a uh, as a catalyst for your biofuel in that case what will happen uh, you have to show that this is this is good and have been quality was there which i produced then you can you have to mix it now while you are mixing you know the general concept in fact in our uh, many research paper when you talk when you submitted review the common question is like a general question come you know particle is solid in nature how you are going to uh, uh, mix it if you put it in the biodiesel how is the solid and liquid will mix because it's not soluble in nature in generally that's basically surfactant will play a very big role now which surfactant will be using you will be using with what by this nano particle for this you need a little bit background of chemistry and i in fact since i am a mechanical background i took help from my chemistry department people that how they can give us a, uh, this one idea that which surfactant we can be used and which will be useful for the all of us that basically not only choice of nanoparticle if you just uh, this one develop in your lab surfactant also will, will play a key role because surfactant will make sure whether this is uh, mixing with the biofuel properly or not okay so choice of surfactant play a role for which you need to have a background of chemistry then uh, once you have a surfactant nanoparticle is ready with you you can put it in a sonicator which we used we have a in facility in energy shelter where basically a sonicator is nothing but it's it's uh, mixes it at high with high energy so that it became stable because the stability analysis is an important once you mix the nanoparticle with uh, surfactant and biodiesel you have to keep it you have to see that at least it it remains stable for how many days or how many hours because it within the stability period you have to use it in the engine thus if you if you can choose a nanoparticle at the at the end user will not be having some water only mixing it and using it thus basically if you can if you can identify a suitable surfactant for which it will remain stable for some maybe 20 30 days or maybe more than that it is it will be very good work in which basically you will able to uh, uh, see that whether it there they are basically stable or not stable means if it's stable it will remain uh, floating on the fuel if it's unstable you'll see it will start uh, what to say um, at the bottom of the glass if you in a in a, in a uh, tube if you keep you'll see the bottom it will start uh, accumulated okay so in our case basically uh, we we have um, used some sample for example like neat diesel or basically ratio of neat diesel is 100% biodiesel palm diesel is basically for b20 which is a 20% uh, biodiesel and b13 is basically 30% biodiesel versus diesel and b100 is this 
uh, we've used 50 to 100 ppm of uh, nanoparticle. And for INP, the name is 50, 70, 100. And for GNP, it is graphene, so we have name of GNP, 50, 70, 30, and 100. So previously it was with uh, diesel, now it's with biodiesel, this is the name of the given. Now, uh, fuel properties, of course, we have to follow some ASTM standard to measure the uh, properties. So very important properties of density, viscosity, calorie below, flash point, uh, cloud point, four point. The other properties are also there. If you see the ASTM standard, you can see, but these are basic properties you must test before you go for engine performance. Then uh, fuel properties of tested fuel, we, we can see that uh, if we use the nanoparticle, the density and viscosity will keep on increasing. On the other side, calorie will below also goes on increasing. Thus, uh, basically, compared to normal diesel, uh, biodiesel have basically higher density and viscosity. Biodiesel has higher density and viscosity and lower calorie below. Thus, if we increase nanoparticle, we see that calorie below of the biodiesel sample increases. Okay, so this is a positive sign, but density and viscosity also increases. Thus, basically, rate of increase will play play a decisive role, and you have to be uh, this one. Uh, you have to be uh, sharp enough to take a decision that until what level you will choose, which is a key criteria. So as I told uh, that initially, whatever the people have done, they have just arbitrarily maybe 21 data, 25 ppm, parts per million or 50 ppm or 70 ppm. Just one below they have taken their published reason. But if somebody wants to do a serious decision, I think they have to find out the suitable combination, the which combination, which, what is the range of, uh, a range of uh, nanoparticle can be added with uh, that uh, with uh, with the biodiesel so that it is stable. And second thing, just I uh, miss one point. You can see that in the previous slide I told that we have used the uh, uh, catalyst as a surfactant is oligoes. You know that in a biodiesel, one of the key component is a oligo oligoes is the key component. Okay, that's basically even if since we have chosen uh, oligo oligoes uh, uh, this one oligoes it has the surfactant does basically it will not hamper the biodiesel. Okay, so this is a determination of test fuel uh, sample. I'm just uh, going to we can we can do the GCMS. We can we can see the percentage uh, the composition chemical composition. Uh, in the in the in the case of your test fuel properties, one of the key parameters oxygen. As I said that if you use a or choose a nanoparticle which will be which will act like antioxidant like. Iron is a iron uh, act as a very good antioxidant, which has the affinity to absorb oxygen. Similar, okay. So in in in, in our case, we have studied uh, that if we we have chosen iron, one of the reason is that it yeah, plain iron can act as a uh, antioxidant. Uh, antioxidant, so it will it will have affinity to absorb the oxygen. So what we did, uh, we can see that uh, oxygen percentage of uh, pure uh, PB100 means your uh, palm biodiesel is 10.18 percent, and we, we have started uh, 40 ppm, 50 ppm, 60 ppm, 70 till 120 ppm. So what happened with PB100? We started from 10.18, and it is uh, keeps on decreasing with 6.98, and it has increased up to 9.675. And for PB20, because we'll be using 20 PB20 percent, so it's 2.82. And when you use INP50, you can see that uh, with INP50. Uh, uh, your this one uh, PV20 is going at 2.48, which is basically uh, less than this. So it's a good sign. Similarly, in case of uh, your this one also, uh, your uh, with INP again INP PV20, it's, it's coming at 1.31. So 75 ppm, you can see that 6.98 is here, which is lowest. And PV20, it is 1.2. I, I forgot to, I saw, sorry, I forgot to color it. You can see that INP70, that is 75 ppm of iron with PV20 showing a 1.2, which is much lower than this. Okay. If I show it in the uh, diagram, wise, what basically our aim, you know, the diesel means INP0. Okay. INP0 means uh, in a um, this one, combination, in a, in a, in a uh, combination, basically, what you can see. Uh, uh, INP0 means there is no nanoparticle. So it's a pure PV, PV blend and here 50 ppm and uh, 75 ppm and 100 ppm, PV20 and 30 and 100, okay? So, sorry, PV20, 30 and 100, PV100. And uh, what is happening? Uh, we can see that uh, our aim is to reach to here, INP0 for PV20 without nanoparticle, whatever is there, uh, since the oxygen percentage of 
PB20 is higher, we want to reach to this, this uh, we want to reach to these places, okay? So then with nanoparticle concentration, uh, we can we can see that oxygen percentage reduces. So here, this is a simple uh, engine setup which is available in our uh, mechanical uh, department. Uh, uh, mechanical uh, mechanical uh, department uh, where which from on which we have performed the experiments. You can see that in the previous year, whatever is Professor Rukum has shown in his experiment, he has done the as, uh, speed variation, which is a very good. But thing is that we do not have facility speed variation. We have now, but while we did this experiment, we are not having uh, any this one. Uh, facility on that, uh, so that basically we are using this only. So what we did, we just set the, the escaping this all this, this emission parameters, uh, this uncertainty analysis is a key parameter. Now uh, for our uh, comparison of the results, what we did, we just uh, we defined a value beta. For example, we want that compared to diesel, a particular sample, how much it has been improved. Like we want to improve the value of BT. You can see this. there is a little mistake about the printing. Uh, so we can see beta INP 50D BT. So we want to see that BT of INP 50 sample has been improved by what? So what we do? We put BT INP 50 in the uh, uh, denominator and denominator we put BT diesel. So what is the ratio is coming? If the beta is more than one, that is this BT is increased. If the your uh, beta is less than one, that is because of use of INP your uh, this value is reduced okay in a particular value these are the engine tests so i have we have performed with the mid diesel and p50 pv20 and the 70 pv20 and the 100 pv20 and engine load as i said that we, we, did, we did not have the facility at that time to vary the uh, engine speed so we just vary the engine load for a particular constant speed and performance parameter like BT, PSC, GT, and emission parameter like SCC, NOx, and combustion like uh, cylinder pressure and net heat release has been used. Uh, uh, is it okay? Am I audible on other things? I'm not sure actually. I'm not getting a response. No, okay, if anything is there uh, in between, you can interrupt. I don't have any issue. You can you can interact. Huh? Sure. Sir. So uh, here, basically, uh, in this engine performance, what we did, we just uh, have a this one, uh, a BT variation with load. You can see that uh, compared to uh, diesel, if we use the PV20, the BT is little bit reduced. This reduction in BT is basically directly we can create in this one. Uh, tell that uh, since the biodiesels are having lower calorific value and higher density and viscosity so there is a less amount of uh, your this one uh, uh, in uh, improper mox, uh, mixing and proper uh, this one uh, um, atomization there is a less atomization of uh, fuel sample because of higher density and viscosity on the other side uh, basically your calorific value is less so that's basically bt of biodiesel samples are less now just give me a minute One important thing here is you have to measure that since the uh, biodiesel, in case of diesel engines, we do not measure the this one um, uh, mass. We, we measure what? We measure the volume of the fuel sample. That's basically, especially in lower load, you can see that BT is less. Whereas, as we keep on increasing the load at 90%, 100%, we can see that BT is slightly increased. Here, what happened? Since we are increasing, though the calorific value is less, since the density and viscosity is high, so basically higher amount of fuel is being injected in this in the engine and basically bt is increased okay thus we can see that at higher load only it is overcome slightly whereas at lower load it's not it's not uh, it's less only in case of biodiesel bsc is a direct representation or is a replica of bt only so bsc gives us the uh, break specific energy consumption how much energy is consumed we know that with the increase in load uh, your engine is more efficient and it's a in this one Consumption of fuel, megajoule per kilo or production of hour is less. So basically, as we keep on adding, adding, uh, increasing the uh, load or uh, break specific energy consumption is reduced. And then we have to see that how biodiesel or the nanoparticle fuel sample are acting. 
Here you can see that with the addition of uh, bio, biofuel or biodiesels, uh, we, the, it is almost uh, decreasing uh, in nature uh, for all the fuel load. That is basically less amount of uh, energy has been consumed in case of uh, PV20 synthetic less. Now I'm going back to the uh, previous, uh, previous slide again. Uh, here, uh, I just missed one point to mention, uh, which is basically, what is the role of INP? This iron nanoparticle. You can see uh, as we add INP, the iron nanoparticle, what will happen? It will take part in the combustion. That is, since their nano levels, so atomization will increase one point. And during combustion, uh, you know, uh, that uh, if the if, because of in presence of a nanoparticle, they will take part in the heat transfer. It will, it will transfer heat very fast. Since it will uh, transfer heat very fast, what will happen? It will enhance the uh, this uh, combustion characteristics for which basically it will uh, it will it will help in uh, this one, uh, and, uh, of taking part in the enhancing the combustion or the performance in very rapidly and that is, as I said that BSEC is a replica of this thus basically uh, it, it will uh, take part here only then EGT is exact gas temperature is not uh, is not that uh, very uh, what to say, uh, it's not a uh, very uh, important uh, parameter, but still we have just kept it. So AGT will keep on increasing as we increase the load because of burning of more fuel. Now let us see that what basically is, as I said, beta is something, beta one means C. Uh, my denominator was diesel. So every performance of diesel divided by diesel is one. So one means it is remain same. But for PV20, you can see that BT has been increased for PV20, but at what load? Uh, this elective person load and BSEC is reduced, EGT is increased. For INP, INP, you know, uh, your BT increased, every case is BT increased. But you see, if you see this graph from this way, one to some value, then this way, then it's that is till INP 75 uh, or BT is increased after that, it start taking. Thus, it's indicate that uh, performance of the engine is, is a key parameter and which depends on the oxygen content. This plays a uh, uh, this one, very good role. And since we have used a range of iron nanoparticle from 50 to 100, and to decide this range, we have studied uh, oxygen content from 40 ppm to 120 ppm. Thus, one uh, this 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 paper uh, published by the this one in ASIM journal by this one, uh, Deborma and uh, Misra, where uh, basically uh, it is. It has shown that this is the uh, according to us is the first paper where basically they have shown that why some range has to be selected. But again, this range is valid only for INP. Thus, other who wants to pursue this kind of area work, they can take any any other fuel and they can use any other nanoparticle. They can see if it can vary. It can it can uh, this one uh, take part. So accordingly, we can they can put their results. Then in case of 100% load, again, the same trends are complete that INP75 was a better results. Then exhaust emission, that is AC, hydrocarbon. You know, the hydrocarbon has been produced, there is a lack of oxygen and uh, hydrocarbon on the production of hydrogen carbon uh, decreases with the enhancement of combustion. So with the use of biodiesels, which provide additional oxygen. And in case of nano, in, in presence of nanoparticle, which also helps to enhance the, uh, this one, uh, combustion part. Thus, basically, they, they, they help to enhance the, the reduce the AC emission. The CO emission it also reduces uh, with the in presence of basically both um, PV uh, uh, biodiesels and nanoparticle. Similarly, for NOx also here is a fair. We know that AC and CO is automatically um, reduces because of better combustion or in presence of oxygen or in presence of uh, this nanoparticle. But NOx is play a critical role. Uh, NOx, what happened? Uh, we have higher amount of oxygen, so combustion is enhances. This combustion is enhances, basically, we are expecting that I don't know, uh, so NOx emission will be higher. Point to but you will see with in presence of nanoparticle, what will happen? The total duration of the combustion reduces. Since the duration of the combustion reduces, that's basically the uh, uh, Time, time of this higher temperature gas available in the cylinder is basically uh, become lower. Thus, what will happen in presence of biodiesels, only biodiesels, uh, NOx emission increases, which also established and people and many other people have shown, but we can see that uh, in presence of iron nanoparticle, 
what has happened since the sum of the oxygen has been taken care and it ends the rate of combustion that's basically what will be total duration of the combustion reduces in annual emission tends to reduce as you will see if you see the uh, published paper in different uh, nanoparticles some people have shown and it increases some people have shown and actually uh, decreases that's basically there is a two thing one is enhancement of combustion but if the duration combustion is reduced then this this is helping to reduce the nox emission so uh, like in the previous uh, case uh, we have in case of 85% loading condition basically you can see that imt 17 p20 is showing a better results uh, both sccu is less but uh, nox is uh, this one, higher uh, now question may come to your mind that compared to this case uh, these two are very less okay so why don't we uh, consider imp 100 now here i have to choose that if we have to uh, take a proper decision i have to take both uh, engine part and emission part so combining both you can consider 75 is better then uh, skipping this uh, so in cylinder pressure this uh, diagram is very less you know that cylinder pressure will increase in case of uh, nanoparticle and your combustion is enhances ignition delays reduce so it is out it's it, 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 it is supposed to this one advance okay but uh, you can see that uh, our p uh, theta diagram is not that we could have drawn it in a lower uh, range then the it could have shown better results but only concept is this if you use the nanoparticle our total magnitude of the peak pressure will increase and because of advances in combustion reduction of ignition delay it will advance okay pressure to discharge will also increase and what about uh, heat release curve duration of combustion will reduce and your uh, this one uh, uh, combustion will be enhances and the peak value will start uh, getting before earlier than compared to the only diesel or iron uh, case okay so i'm coming almost at the end so basically combined effect if you just consider both uh, uh, engine performance and exhaust emission point of view you can see that imp 70 to pv20 is better both pt bc uh, bcc egt scc and as all point of view because some some emission parameter might be good in 100 but since the the performance plays a key role, so we have we can tell that out of all the sample, IMP7 to PV20 shows a better results, and same hundred percent condition also is same. So in short, or gist, if I just uh, say that with the increase in concentration of nanoparticle density and viscosity increases, but relative zero decreases of the nanopore sample. So for IMP100, PV20 density has been increased by 1.21 percent, viscosity has been increased by 16.5 percent, but relative zero has been reduced by 1.7 percent. Whereas at eighty-five percent loading condition uh, for IMP seventy-five, PB hundred PT is increased by four point seven percent. SC is reduced by two point five six. US is reduced by twenty-seven point two, and NOx is reduced by two point three nine percent. Whereas at hundred percent loading condition, the range is like this only two percent increase, and PC is zero point five three percent reduced. SC is reduced by nine point nine percent. US is reduced by eighteen percent. NOx is being reduced by two percent. So this is the overall calculation of the systems. So as I told that uh, this most of the results have been uh, basically taken from my colleagues, Dr. Sumit Dagan and Professor Adi Mishra. All the Mishra, they are doing very good work. So I acknowledge their to their support to give the data information knowledge shared by them, and also experimental facility of biodiesel laboratories of Madhya Pradesh and Assam. I acknowledge, and I also. Uh, I could see many participants would be from northeast uh, part and other part of uh, India also. If you are interested to do, work in this area, we have very good and some facilities. We almost have a project uh, through which we have developed a lab by not only me, a group of colleagues are there. It's combined. Maybe we have a project of almost two crores, more than two crores, and we have developed a good setup. And not only that, we are also establishing. We are moving towards hydrogen and. And in Nano Fuel, we are developing the setup. So I thank uh, everyone for your patience. So this is my contact. If any one of you have anything to share, so what I'll do, uh, this contact is remain with you. Now how can I see the comments? So that's all from my end. Uh, so I'll keep. This. Okay, thank Hello. you so much, sir. Hello. Yes, yes. Uh, let me just, uh, I'll just stop here. So, okay. Thank you very much, sir.
it's a very lucid talk that you have given so thank you so much now there are some one or two queries are there so can we will be able to take it sir yeah it's sure, no problem and i am sorry okay. if i have uh, taken much time no no no, no, no. it's okay no, it's okay very nice okay so sir what the mate is the question from uh, ratnadeep malakar he is asking what are the emerging technologies for processing of multi crop residues okay you mean to say like uh, if i got it correct that uh, he wants a multi crop residues are there he want to take it say for residues uh, uh, biodiesel extraction is not but pyrolysis might be one process from which they can take it they can extract oil okay so but since i am not expert in i think uh, tomorrow there is a lectures by dr uh, this one uh, pankaj kalita uh, uh, not Pank not only pankaj the okay other... yeah, monos monos bodala is also yeah, there he is a, he is expert in uh, pyrolysis he has done a very good work uh -huh. he will able to answer it but if we are using a micro this on a uh, multi crop there is no problem if you are doing pyrolysis only thing is that uh, uh, you do not you first you need to identify the which source is affecting the which parameter so if you are multi crop together you may not be able to this one identify that which crop is responsible for which properties okay 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 thank you now uh, is there uh, any one any query from dr venkatesh t lalmani lamani so would you sir please uh, unmute yourself uh, okay please ask sir please yeah. thank you yeah. this is dr venkatesh lamani from bangalore bms college okay. thank you sir uh, good afternoon good, good evening good evening Good evening, sir. Uh, thank uh, you, Das, sir, for sharing your wonderful uh, experience, your expertise with us. Thank you. This, thank you. Uh, workshop. Yes, yeah, sir. I have uh, some queries like uh, this nanoparticles. No, sir. Yeah. So basically, uh, we have oxygen uh, itself in the biodiesel. Yeah. So that is one part. So nano, what is the contribution of nanoparticles? Like uh, it has, it don't has calorific value, right, sir? Yeah. Whatever the nanoparticles we have considered, yeah. is is that nanoparticle contribute for the calorific value side? No, no. Are only oxygen contained? No. Uh, okay. Uh, thermal is conductivity. It... I understand. Thermal conductivity wise, uh, spray characters it may improve, uh, but uh, uh, if the uh, uh, the other side is nozzle nozzle chunking, uh, may be the other issue uh, with nanoparticles. That is what I have read in literature. So uh, one that that is one query, first query, sir. Okay, let me answer it. Is it okay? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah. So so see, uh, uh, while while you are using the nozzle, uh, this one, nanoparticle, you have to see that there there may be issues come up with the nozzle. But on the other side, if the size of the nanoparticle is very less, and if you are using a proper surfactant, if they are soluble with the biofuel, then nozzles uh, part you can avoid. Of course, size of size of the nanoparticle will play a role. But before that, uh, as you said, that conductivity will have a role, but uh, it will not affect the uh, this one uh, calorific value. Calorific value will also reduce with the with the in presence of nanoparticle. Now, uh, where it may play a role, if as I said, that uh, choice of nanoparticle will play a role if it is oxygen affinity in nature, like iron, it always have a tendency to absorb oxygen and to convert itself to iron oxide. Okay, so if the free oxygen available in the biodiesel and if there is iron type of since since I am mechanical, I not expert in chemistry people they will have if you ask them they will give you the idea that which type of uh, materials are there which have the oxygen affinity system so they will absorb more amount of oxygen okay so this is point 1 mm -hmm. and point 2 is though they are not chemically uh, this one uh, in the in the this one chemical composition will not change but because of use of this nanoparticle they will take part in the combustion indirectly they will help us to transfer the heat uh, to absorb some of the oxygen it will help to reduce the nox emission and uh, on the other side, there will be better uh, atomization because of in presence of nanoparticles. Because they'll be once they are mixing again, uh, surfactant will play a key role. I think I I, I could have. Um, yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Sir, uh, since uh, the application uh, is on diesel engines, right? Diesel engine, yeah. no, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, uh, you presented very good results. Uh, I think you have published in very good journals also. But uh, uh, I have not seen soot results sir, actually. Like soot is one of the major uh, emission from diesel. I mean, diesel engine. Yes, 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 yes. Yes, yes actually, CO, uh, CO. because because of this because of this uh, shortage shortage of time, I have not shown the results. Maybe one third of the results I have shown. I just escaped it. Okay. So, so soot results. Uh, if, if you if you See the this one a nanoparticle suit is suit is up to some percentage of suit it will increase. Okay, sir, for uh, this uh, uh, measurement, no, sir, emission measurements, 
Uh, what what device we are using, sir? Five gas analyzer, uh, the main. Yes, yes, uh, ABL five gas analyzer. And uh, so regarding suit, sir, suit again ABL, ABL only, no, sir. Uh, ABL only, sir. Yes, yeah, sir. Just last question, sir. Last yeah, question, yeah. like uh, it, uh, this, uh, especially this green fuels or biodiesels, it is in uh, uh, news in India from long back, sir, around eighties. From eighties, it is in news. But uh, if you can compare to the market side. So it is only limited to research now. It is not yeah. people. Okay. Right? Yeah, that is a, national. Yeah, what basically, see, if you if you see uh, in, in many of the countries, 20% they are mandatory, and India also has a dream of 20% replacement. But uh, initial my presentation, I have shown that uh, ethanol, they even they may go for 20%, but biodiesel is not possible because of unavailability of the resources. And second thing is like what we did, we just, uh, there was a lot of government scheme. I think you are from South side. So you, you might have seen many of the, our agricultural land, they have converted to Jatruba plantation to get some money for the scheme and all. But what is that? So once you learn this one, plant Jatruba, that land is become barrel land. Uh, you have to use a barrel land, but if agricultural land you are using for Jatruba plantation, it's not a proper uh, suggested. But on the other side, because of our food security is a key issue, we do not have used production. But on other countries, they are not depending on Jatruba. They are even from palm or uh, some other coconut or uh, other edible oil, which is, and they use it for this one, uh, uh, for fooding purpose. What we use for food purpose, they are using for biodiesel. That's why we are successful. We are not successful in India. So, Thank you, sir. One more, uh, maybe the injection pressure may be playing role. Uh, if you can increase the injection pressure, right now for this engine, I think it is 200 bar is limited. If you can change the injection pressure to 1000 bar, maybe uh, again, we can see the improvement in results, no, sir? Because, uh, yeah, but thing is that uh, when, again, you are if you are injecting the pressure, if, that means you have to change the existing system. If you have to change the existing system, our aim is not not only research. Okay, we may get improvement, but if we are using the injection system means you have to replace the whole system. Our main idea was to use an unmodified engine. That's what people have started using B20, not going for B30 and all. Because if you have to modify the engine, then there is a lot of research can be done. The basic idea was to such a suitable condition so that unmodified engine can be used. That is the constant, as I said in the in the previous or early uh, PPTs, that uh, unmodified engine we have to use, and for that, that is the constraint. No. No. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Any any research co collaboration is possible uh, with? Yeah, I have given my contact. I have given my contact in the last slide. No. Okay. I uh, I'm not sure if it's the visible to you. Uh, yes, yeah, sir. Yeah, I have taken, sir. I have taken a snapshot. I have taken a snapshot. <laughs> uh, thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you for your wonderful presentation. Thank you, sir. Thank you. And thanks okay. uh, for organizer also uh, for yes, arranging yes, such yes, a wonderful. Yes, yes, playing the main okay. role because of him we are here. <laughs> okay, Mr. Fankates, Dr. Fankates, thank you. Yes, yeah, sir. Thank you. Thank, thank you sir. for your nice query. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Okay, now Mr. Biplab Das, Dr. Biplab Das, is a very nice presentation, very lucid presentation. Thank you, thank you. But after okay, uh, and I am I am quite confirmed, but I am really, really very sorry because uh, it took a little bit of time because uh, that earlier the previous the speaker actually he got trouble today uh, due to this uh, no problem, technical no. problem. Huh? So extremely sorry. So I apologize. No, no, for no, that. it's okay. It's okay. <laughs> so in future we are we look to look forward for to meet you again in our department. So I convey my best regards. And heartful of thanks from the Department of Mechanical Engineering and also the ASTU, Assam Science and Technology University. Thank you, sir. Thank you once again. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for Thank giving you. the opportunity Thank and inviting you. me. Thank okay. you. Thank bye you. bye. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, bye. all the participants. Thank you. I uh, I'm signing up. Okay. Thank you. Now, dear all participants, uh, to, uh, tomorrow we have got the last uh, session. Uh, the last day of session. Uh, the, the two sessions will be there. The one, the first one will be the Pankaj Kalita. So he'll be delivering lecture on the integration of emerging technologies for the clean power generation. The second will be on by the Monos Bodoloi. He'll be delivering the lecture on the role of characterization in the research of bio waste conversion. So I, I, I need the full support from your side. And you please interact with the people because you see, you learn to learn because you need to know more. And this is the, like, the chances are there now. These are the ample chances because we are meeting the people. So you can ask your queries. And that will be, I think, that will be that will be proving a very fruitful uh, webinar for us. So I expect a very huge support from your side. 
and thank you once falling. Thank you. Thank you all. Meet you tomorrow. <laughs>